All right. Good evening. I'd like to call to order the Edina Park Board meeting for uh, Tuesday, May 12th, 2015. And to get started, can I please get a uh, roll call, Janet? Yep. Member Jacobson? Here. Member Good? Here. Member Jones? Here. Member McCormick? Here. Member Gisagi? Here. Member Sella? Here. Member Segreto? Here. Member Strother? Here. All right. Thank you. Uh, next is an approval of the meeting agenda. If I can get a motion, please. All right, motion seconded. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed? All right, motion passes. Moving on to the adoption of the consent agenda. Uh, the minutes, is there a motion for that, please? So moved. Second. Is there a second? Second. All right. There is a second, so all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed? All right, motion passes. Next section is community comment uh, for the public. Is there anyone here that wishes to stand up and uh, brief us with any comments at this point. All right, see no one, we can move on to the uh, reports and recommendations section. The first item is item A, the staff uh, uh, introduction of Amanda, and I think Susan is gonna do that. Yes, so I have the pleasure of introducing and welcoming Amanda Holly, who is starting in her new role as recreation supervisor. Um, Amanda and I worked together um, at Edinburgh Park when I first started with the city, and um, Amanda has a lot of great skills and is a real tremendous um, asset to our department. Amanda's here and is going to share a little bit more about uh, her experiences. Um, hi, I've been working for the city of Edina since um, 2012 full-time. Um, I have a Bachelor's of Science um, from the University of Minnesota. Um, I recently, um, or sorry, I found my passion working in the field when I started working at the city of Minnetonka in 2003. Um, right after college, I started working for the city of Edina in 2009 part-time at Edinburgh Park. Um, in 2012, I became the assistant manager of Edinburgh Park and the Edina Aquatic Center. I was there for about a year and a half until I was offered the position of assistant manager at Braemar Arena and then eventually Braemar Field. Um, both all wonderful facilities. Um, I, um, sorry, um, I have a solid background in facility management as well as recreation programs. Um, I am excited to bring that knowledge to my new position as recreation supervisor, and um, I look to continue growing recreation programs as well as um, providing new opportunities for residents of Edina. If you guys have any questions, please let me know. Thank you. Yeah, welcome. I do have I do have a couple. Yeah, but they're they're comfortable, easy questions. Okay, no, uh, that's fine. <laughs> where are you from? Where did you grow up, and and why the interest in uh, park and recreation management? Um, well, I grew up in Hopkins, um, so I went to Hopkins High School. I started working for the city of Minnetonka um, in two thousand three at um, one of their fitness facilities. Um, and then started doing some of their summer programs. So I was in charge of like the parks program, um, T-ball, um, one of their camps. Um, and then since those were more seasonal, I started working over at the Minnetonka Ice Arena, Grays Bay Marina, um, pretty much every facility, the community center there, um, all year round. And that's when I realized when I was going to college, I didn't know at the time I was going for um, management or marketing I was going down the business route and when I realized that you could go and get a degree in recreation that's when I transferred to the U of M and um, that's where I got my um, recreation administration degree so yeah thank you yeah any other questions no, no? All right. thank you all right well welcome thank yeah thank you all right, moving on to the next item on the agenda. It's the Braemar City of Lakes Figure Skating Club and Edina Hockey Association Memorandum of Understanding. And I think uh, Susie Miller will speak to that. Good evening, and thank you for having me here tonight. Um, I'm actually very pleased to talk about the Memorandum of Understanding tonight, so um, thank you. Oh, thank you. I know there's a quicker way to do this, but I don't. Oh, thank you. Okay. 
All right, I don't use PowerPoint uh, very often anymore. So I really, like I said, I'm very pleased to present this. I think um, there was many of you that were involved um, in this process a couple years ago, and so happy to come back and report what, where we're at today. So just a little history for those of you who are not involved. Um, in the spring of 2013, we were evalu evaluating the use of the facility. Um, in July of 2013, we brought forward a recommendation to Park Board and then to City Council. Um, at that time, City Council directed us to go back and meet with the Dine Hockey Association and the Braemar City Lakes Figure Skating Club to work on um, a, an agreement of use of the facility. We held the meetings with no resolution. It was um, everybody wanted more than what we were able to offer. And then um, in the August 2013 meeting, Council directed us to um, to reduce the number of hours for the Braemar City Lakes Figure Skating Club by 159 hours for the 2013 20 to 2014 and the 2014 to 2015 season, and then come back and report um, how the process went, how our groups are feeling, and where we want to go in the future. So that is why I'm here today, and then we'll be pre presenting to Council next week. Um, some highlights of the memorandum that you, were, that you um, received with your packet is um, that we're going to continue as it's been for the past two years with that 159-hour reduction. Um, the Braemar City Lakes Figure Skating Club is making a very strong effort to give back hours that they do not use that are in their designated use time. Um, you know, continuing to coexist at Braemar Arena. It's, it's like I say, it's, um, you know, it's a very, two very, very passionate groups that use our facility. And so um, to work together to continue to coexist, one of the ways we're going to work on that is that we're going to meet annually um, to just discuss, not necessarily discuss hours and use of time, but just discuss the relationship in the building. We're going to exchange the use of the east and south arenas. Historically, the east arena was the figure skating arena. The south arena was the hockey association arena. Um, we're alternating the use of that. So for this year, the figure skating is going to use the south arena for January and February. Um, and this is in an effort to maximize the use of a new shooting cage that we put in in the south arena, and then also for use of the outdoor locker rooms. Um, the Braemar City Lakes Figure Skating Club also in this agreement is um, used to be kind of a use it or lose it mentality and we're going to, um, in this agreement it says that the club is going to have rights to these hours so if by chance they were not able or did not need to use a certain night they would be able to come back and get that, um, that time at a later date if they were going to be able to use it the next year. Um, this memorandum is for five years, it's a five-year term, so effective this September through March of 2020. And if you have any questions. So this is more of just for review or information that because both groups are, you know, are in agreement. I wouldn't say that either, both groups are completely 100% thrilled with, um, <laughs> with the outcome, but they're in agreement and they have decided, you know, kind of the conversation was, if one group was happy and one wasn't, then it wouldn't be a great agreement. So, um, so they're moving forward. Susie, I think there is a uh, Scrivener's error in the agreement. If, if you look at, um, in paragraph one, where the paragraph starts with the uh, acronym BCLFSC, the second line of that says, during January and February when tenant I think this was a form, and uh, rather than tenant, I think it should be reading EHA. This, um, you're correct. That it should be actually the Braemar City Lakes Figure Skating Club. Right. In, um, yes. It was starting out to be a contract with the attorney, and then it right. was um, changed into a memorandum. Right, it's just a little cleanup, but it, yep. should, be, it should be clear. Are you making note of that, Janet? I didn't bring a pen up. Okay, thank you. All right, any other board member comments, questions? Yeah. All right, nice yeah, job. Well, well, oh, we do have one. I, okay. I have a, a question. Um, there's no mention of, a, uh, I believe there's a per player uh, fee. This isn't any, this, um, that is included in their contract on an annual basis, um, the per player fee. And so that has been in, um, for the past two years, it's been in the works. It will continue to be in the works with both groups. So we charge that $20 user fee. 
Um, so that's not a part of, this is more of an understanding saying, yes, we agree, we want to continue to go at, coexist in this fashion, but then each of them will sign a contract that includes that user fee on an annual basis for their use with their hours. Okay, and that was something that we were, as a board, we were going to discuss a little bit further, um, considering that that per player fee was um, instigated when the hornet's nest was built. And I'm not, I, I just want to put that maybe on a later agenda for discussion, whether it's appropriate to be charging the skating organization for th that. Right, and I think, I mean, it, we haven't, um, the skating club is supportive of that, and one of the reasons being that they have other use in the facilities. So both groups have different facility uses. So um, the figure skating club, for example, with the addition of the outdoor rink, we remodeled. I actually brought some pictures just in case there was questions about the... Um, Well, if you can see down here, so there's, we put, with the addition of the outdoor rink, we put in um, new restrooms, four new locker rooms for the outdoor rink along this wall. Well, right about where that is, used to be the figure skating club room, and now they have a new club room um, down just a little bit farther um, towards the main corridor. And um, so they have facilities that the Eden Hockey Association members don't have. So it's so at this point, everyone seems um, that they feel like they're getting a benefit. Okay, and um, with the new ice, is that all, Is does the Skating Association get any of that ice time on the? If they, if they wanted it, they certainly could request it. They haven't had a desire for that. Okay, so that's all, is that all going toward the Hockey Association time? Yep. Yeah, they've been, the Hockey Association actually, they had to, in order for it to be approved, they committed to 40 hours a week, but last year they actually bought between 44 and 46 hours a week. Okay, and the Figures Association, the Figure Skating Association is fine with? Yeah, the, I mean, the Figure Skating Association was very, con, was very happy with the number of hours that they're receiving. Okay, um, and I, just as another point, I'm just wondering, as far as, uh, Reporting is the is the dome and the are, is the new ice rink going to be considered part of Bremer Ice Arena enterprise or is that a different is that going to be considered a different enterprise for no. financial bookkeeping? The backyard rink is a part of the Bremer Arena enterprise, and then Bremer Field and the dome are a separate enterprise. Okay. okay. And um, lastly, <laughs> just one I quick question. <laughs> Um, the, it doesn't look like the um, high school is a part has a part of this type of agreement. Is that a, is that? Not, I'm it's, just wondering how Edina City handles scheduling for the high school ice time. The high school has just been the way that it's always been scheduled after after school. Um, it hasn't been. I guess it wasn't a part of the initial discussion. Okay. Okay. That's all. Thanks. All right. Well, thank you, Susie. That's it. All right. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Moving on to one of the two larger issues of the night is item C of the Braemar Golf Course Master Plan. And to start us out will be Joe Abood.
what's going on. Um, in June of uh, 2014, City Council appointed to bring our master plan and task force. Uh, we have several members of <coughs> that group here tonight. And I'll start off by saying I apologize, I have a cold, so I'm gonna have to fight through this a little bit of coughing. We can't hear you in the back. There you go. All good? So, uh, City Council appointed Braemar Master Plan Task Force. Uh, we have members of the task force here tonight. We have Paul Prestis, Pacey Ark, Joseph Hulbert, and Brenda McCormick. Um, we'll uh, get some of their comments a little bit later on in the presentation. Um, an RFP was issued for the Braemar Master Plan in uh, July of last year. 28 golf course architects responded. It was a great turnout. Um, we. Uh, chose to interview five of those uh, uh, candidates, and we ended up uh, choosing uh, Richard Mandel of uh, Pinehurst, North Carolina, who is a extremely good architect. He's come up with some very good plans for us, so we're all very excited about that. Um, once Mandel started, uh, he conducted uh, site walks, he conducted open houses, we um, did surveys to get the, the general public's uh, perception of what they wanted to see at Braemar. Um, and then we had present presentations to the community uh, with Bar Engineering and Task Force, and we actually presented to the Park Board a little while ago. Uh, it's been a while, and there's been a lot of changes ever since then, so get you back up to speed. Uh, we presented to the City Council in February of this year. And then uh, uh, Richard finished his renovation business plan uh, as of April, and we're looking to uh, presented to you tonight. Uh, everybody should have a copy of it and uh, hopefully you had a chance to review it. There are still six concepts that are on the table. Um, we want tonight to have some review and comment and then we want to present to the City Council in June of uh, uh, next month. Um, Richard Mandel, uh, he uh, is very good at communicating with the public. Um, the walkthroughs that we did, he walked the golf course, he took the time, he, we, it was probably 70 to 100 people that he met with it during the first walkthroughs. Um, what he figured out were the opening holes of the Castle Nine, the, the main nine uh, of, the, of the golf course was, you know, it is just too difficult and set a bad tone for the golfing experience. Um, the golf course is too long and too narrow for the majority of women golfers, so it's not very women friendly as it stands right now. Uh, the water features out there, <clears throat> they were sur surrounded and had a, <clears throat> a large amount of invasive species and that concealed the water hazards, making them more difficult. Um, we have a lot of different drainage issues out on the golf course that need to be addressed. Um, you know, bumpy fairways, poor drainage, poor soils, and fairways and approaches are pretty much too narrow, and what he wants to do is expand them out, make them more receptive for golfers, uh, making it an um, overall more enjoyable experience. Um, there's a lot of force carries out on the golf course, again, making it very difficult for your average golfer, and that's something we need to, you know, fix going into the future. Um, what he found out is generally golfers don't like the Clooney 9. Um, it's something as an operator that I've seen over the last uh, nine months since I got here. So, you know, it's something we have to address right now and ha have to address moving forward. Uh, because it's not a very popular golf course and, and we're 20 years into it and it needs some, some updates to it. Um, older golfers don't necessarily like the Clooney because of the elevation changes. Um, Clooney 9 is very narrow and has a lot of forced carries. So, and there's also too many bunkers and very poor placement of the bunkers. So there's, there's a lot of things going on with the Clooney 9 that need to be addressed in, you know, in uh, Richard's uh, different concepts he does address all of these. Um, this slide, it, it'll just give you an idea of when things should be replaced on a golf course. And if you look at them, most of the uh, <laughs> major infrastructure uh, issues, we are still dealing with the original construction. Uh, tee boxes should be uh, changed out 15 to 20 years. We've been 50 years and 20 years on Clooney. Irrigation system uh, controls need to be changed. All these different things as you can see, are basically the originals. Um, and then we had some changes about 34 years ago, but most of the things on the Clooney 9 are original and need to be updated. And it's things that haven't been done over the, uh, over the past years and need to get done in, at some, in some manner or another so we can 
proceed into the future and have a, a, a good asset for the city. Um, there are some ecological en enhancements to the design. Uh, Richard did a, a great job um, trying to restore the wetland buffers, eliminate invasive species, and establish appropriate uh, pollinary plantings. Um, he wants to increase the wetland buffers. Um, he wants to restore oak wo woodlands, remove invasive species uh, like buckthorn, and restore the appropriate native understory. Um, he also wants to improve and actually increase the amount of oak savanna that we have on the golf course, so and actually ma maintain those going into the future. So he has a very good plan for what we need to do going into the uh, f future from an ecological perspective. Um, and we want to, uh, you know, develop different educational things throughout the course as well. So he, Richard has a, a lot of good ideas, and I think it's something that we can implement going forward. Um, um, his Richard Mandel's design goals. Um, he doesn't want to fill the wetlands. He wants to use 60-foot buffers because that is the, the that's the basically the minimum they ask or, or the maximum that they are asking for. And he wants to do the maximum all the way around the golf course. So his plan is actually not doing the minimum; it's doing the maximum on every different concept that he, that he has out in here. Um, he wants to <clears throat> widen the fairways. He wants to institute what he calls tee shot distance equity. Uh, what that allows people to do as golfers as I could play with any person up here on the park board and basically we could have a level playing match. We might play from different sets of tees but as we go forward um, you know what I might hit a driver from the the back tees and uh, Louise you might play a, a driver from the ladies tees and we should be having the same golf club going into the green and that's what tee shot distance equity is and that's going to allow us to to improve going for, uh, forward into the future. So. Um, he wants to improve the golf feature infrastructure, and he wants to introduce <clears throat> the additional environmental areas, and we want to create some more general park uses for the uh, facility as a whole, and we want to go ahead and create some trails. Um, we've talked about cross-country skiing and different winter sports and a lot of different things, so we want to utilize the entire Braemar uh, golf property. Um, he came back with six different options for a renovation. Um, six different concepts, all with a different price tag. Um, and uh, basically, we can go through each one of the, the different uh, uh, projects or the different concepts. You can ask questions however you see fit. They all, like I said, all have a different price tag, and that's led us to the, down different roads that we want to go to. Um, option one is the best 27 holes possible. It has a $9 million price tag. It's going to be very expensive to improve what needs to get improved out at the facility. Um, option two is the best 27-hole regulation golf course with minimal disturbance. The first one, he wanted to use the entire footprint of the facility. Option two, it's basically just using the existing footprint and not expanding out into new golfer, uh, golfing areas. Um, option three was be the best 18-hole regulation golf course <clears throat> and turn it in the equivalent into an executive experience. Um, uh, that price tag is still it's up to almost $9 million. The asset that we have with the Clooney 9, it's actually trying to downsize a little bit and go to an 18-hole regulation golf course. Sorry. Better? Um, the price tag uh, is still up there, almost $7 million, but it significantly drops um, because now we are only uh, doing 18 holes on the golf course. Um, option 5 is uh, similar. It's basically turning it into an 18-hole golf course and minimally disturbing the property and not going into some of the outer-lying areas and keeping it just on existing uh, footprint. And then there's option six, uh, which is a new 18-hole golf course with a four-hole practice loop. So there's a lot of different concepts here, and they're all in front of you for your, for your comments. Um, uh, <coughs> excuse me. Um, what we are going to uh, just show you with some of the um, different uh, revenue projections and expense projections. This is a very basic pro forma that was designed to just to give you a kind of a, a footprint of what it will be in the future. Um, we, these are only taking into consideration what we know right now. 
Um, we know the, the Fred Richards closed. We know that we were taking uh, um, the food and beverage operation and turning that over to the tin fish. Um, it's also taking into consideration that we are going to be closing for a period of time in 2015 to upgrade the part of the par three and the driving range. So these are all basic assumptions and we didn't put substantial rate cre increases into them. We just kept it at, at minimum just so we could see if what we were doing in the future. Um, it wasn't meant to say, hey, you know, we're going to have a $10 increase in 2017. We didn't want to put that out there just yet. Um, because we don't know the direction of how we're going to go. So the status quo is basically just taking into consideration the upgrades in the driving range and the par 3. And as you can see, um, there is some, uh, <clears throat> for the, over for the next couple of years, some operational issues where we've improved to where we're in the black. Um, but you can see that's going to be steadily declining as of 2018 without any st substantial increases going into the future. So if we stay at the status quo, it's, we're definitely going to be going down in the future. And there are also uh, some built-in capital items that we have to do in there. So we are going to spend some money in the near future on this golf course. It's just we have to decide how we're going to do that. Um, so if you look at the Regulation 27 holes, um, what you're going to see is uh, that uh, pro forma took into consideration we're going to go into a uh, construction period over three years. So it won't level out until uh, 2020, um, and it's still on a bit of a, a, a decrease through those years without any uh, substantial increases. Um, and that's just based on you know the, the capital that's going to take to fix the colony. All the capital is in there for these uh, different renovation uh, uh, pro formas. As you get into the 18-hole renovation uh, regulation, what you're going to see is we have a, a stronger ability to maintain going into the future without any types of subsidy. So, you know, this doesn't show any rate increases. What this is based on is the fact that we know how many rounds we have at the present time. And we should be able to, uh, to accommodate that same amount of rounds on an 18-hole golf course as we do on a 27 presently. So that's where you're going to see we feel it's, it's without any rate increases going forward into the future, it's a little bit more sustainable. It's not saying that a 27-hole regulation wouldn't do better and has the potential to do better, but it's just saying as a status quo and as of without any rate increases to the, the, to the residents, this is what it's going to look like going over the next seven years. Um, so that being said, uh, staff would, is probably going to recommend the 18-hole option, and that's basically just on uh, the financial reasons. Um, we're just looking at it saying we've been asked as a staff to be 100% uh, cost recovery, and that's the way we need to look at it going into the future. We're not saying that the 27-hole option is not viable. It may very well be, but it would be a little bit more of a risk to the city going forward. Say, um, Joe, <coughs> Joe? <coughs> yes. Excuse me. If I could take you back one page, sure. could could you explain why the twenty-seven hole option drives no increase in operating revenue? Why are those? I mean, obviously it's an increased cost, but compared twenty-seven to eighteen holes, you're saying the operating revenue. There's no way to increase that with an extra nine holes. Um, it'll increase eventually, but it's a three-year process where we're. Uh, no, I, I'm sorry. I mean, increase relative to the twenty to the eighteen hole option. So if you look at the two of those, the, the operating revenue of each really ends up being pretty much the same. I mean, 3.4 to 3.5 million out to 2022. Well, what we have to look at is we did 55,000 rounds last year, okay? Yep. 55,000 rounds can be accommodated on an 18-hole golf course. So we didn't project out a huge increase of rounds coming back. We have 27 holes right now. So we didn't uh, project out a huge increase of people coming back to the facility because there are other options out there. Um, the amount of golfers playing today is pretty much stagnant, so there's not a lot of new golfers going out there. So any round that we would have to get would have to be stolen from different facilities around the area, and other facilities are also increasing or, or updating their assets as well. So it's, it's a very tough market, and it's only based on the fact that 
the amount of rounds that we have now is pretty much very similar to what would be on a 27 hole. So it sounds like there are two embedded assumptions there. One is even increasing the quality of our course will not attract any new rounds. It, it potentially will. We did not but know how, how many that's going to be, though. Yeah, but embedded in the assumptions you're using, you're yes. not projecting that. Correct. Right? And the second is by dropping from 27 holes to 18 holes, you also won't lose any from what we have today. We'll maintain the same 55,000. Uh, we should be in that same area. We might have to change the rounds mix versus 18. We have, we're very heavily um, reliant on nine holes rounds, uh, not rounds of golf right now. Um, that mix will have to change in the future, um, but the rounds will still pretty much be there. Okay, thanks. Joe, Just, I had a question as well. If I remember right, is it about 27,000 rounds of nine holes last year? Correct. And we had about 55,000 total rounds. Correct. What's, what's capacity on an 18-hole course as, as proposed? Capacity, you can do upwards of 65,000 rounds if you are fully, fully utilized. On 18. On, on 18. 18, yes. Okay. So, Joe, I just have one question. You said the numbers, the um, predictions of how much use you have for the, the golf course were based on last year's numbers? Correct. So, but that's when Fred Richards was still open. So how no, are you? This doesn't take in any, any Fred Richards rounds. Yeah, so I guess we were under the assumption that if we're going to close Fred Richards, we'd move the usage over to the, the, 20 set, the nine hole extra. Well, we, we still have the nine hole executive par three golf course. We did increase oh. the rounds over there so okay. uh between the fred richards and the existing uh executive nine holes um between those two golf courses we did thirty thousand rounds it was about fifteen thousand okay. rounds each uh we projected to bring half of those rounds over to mm -hmm. braemar so we're we're look at these models say that we're going to do 22 23 thousand rounds um it doesn't say we're going to do that right off the bat because we are going into a construction year mm -hmm. right as we start okay Thanks. Okay. Um, so going back to it, you know, staff is looking at it from a, a cost for, uh, recovery perspective, and that's pretty much the, the thing that is driving our recommendation here. And I, I want to say that we're, we're not saying that a 27-hole option won't work, but we're looking at it from a financial pers perspective going into the future and what is going to be the least amount of risk and the, and the best chance for success for the city of Edina going forward. Um, what we can also do is if we go to an 18-hole routing, um, the remaining land can revert, revert, hold on, revert back to parkland, and there could be other uses out there. So that's one of the additional uh, uh, benefits. We want to do, if we choose to go in the 18-hole uh, direction, we want to do a master plan for the entire park prop, uh, Braemar Park property going into the future. So that's the, some of the things that we would like to do just to, you know, fully utilize the, the, uh, the facility and the park for the city of uh, Edina residents. Um, going back to it, we were looking at 100% cost recovery. That's the, our main driving force in this recommendation. Um, you know, once again, the 27-hole option is viable, but it's, you know, it's a lot more risky. And we feel like we can remain accessible to the city residents and to our golfers with an 18-hole option just based on the rounds that we have right now. Um, and we should be able to manage the leagues. With a, we're going to have to uh, better manage how we put the, the leagues out there and the different programming that we have in the future. But uh, we'll be able to manage that going forward. A lot of information just kind of thrown at you. Any questions? I'll start it off. And you and I have talked about this uh, <coughs> outside of this meeting, but someone else had mentioned it. When we decided as a city to close down Fred Richards, there was a room full here, and the atrium room was full of folks that were concerned about full access for everyone. We're trying to serve the whole community. What issues do you foresee if we would go 18 holes? Is that going to limit us? Is that going to handicap us somehow with trying to serve you know youth and the senior groups and the women and, and all constituencies i think we'll be able to accommodate all those golfers on an 18-hole property just on better managing the facility and what i would say is that what we're doing is we're improving the city's golf asset 
and we're making it better, making it more sustainable going into the future. We don't want a situation where it is happening all over the country that golf courses are, are falling off and they're, and they're closing up. And that's something that needs to get done in the golf industry to help correct itself. It was overbuilt for the last 20 years. It needs to correct itself a little bit. And by doing this, you know, we're taking away some of the holes of golf, but we still have plenty of holes of golf in Edina. Um, we still have the par three, which is going to be an extremely good golf course that Kevin Norbury is going to be working on starting in July. So, I mean, that part of our, our, our facility is still there. And what we're doing is we're strengthening our 18-hole asset to where it's going to be there for the next 50 years. So I think, you know, we are, we are taking holes of golf away, but we're still going to be able to accommodate that same number of golfers. Okay, and last question for me. To be the devil's advocate, we lessen our risk. We're more financially responsible with 18. But that's why I was asking those questions about capacity. Mm -hmm. If we create new excitement, we create an, a neat golf course that stirs folks to, to show up, and we have the Fred Richards rounds coming over. Boy, 65,000 rounds capacity, and we're at 55 now. That doesn't leave us a lot. Are we, are we going too far with, with not enough capacity? Um, I don't think so. I mean, to to get to capacity on an 18 and a nine hole, you're going to need to get to 80,000 rounds. So we're, it's it's a long way away. And the uh, the rounds that you're talking about with the the par three, those weren't included in that total. So we're talking about getting to 60,000 rounds and another 20,000 rounds on the par three at, at minimum. So there's going to be a lot of rounds of golf played on that property, and and it's suited to to do that. On the six options that you showed us, yes, there was, I'm assuming, an intentional use of the word best, best 27, best 18. Did Correct. that have a meaning behind it? Why did they say best 18? Well, when we say the best 18 is we're going to take the entire property, and hole number 16 may not be the same 16 as it was. It's going, we're going to reroute it to use the entire 27-hole property to make the best 18 holes out of that. Okay. So did that imply then for the other three options, option four, five, and six, it drops best, that somehow that's different than the best 18 in the executive nine? Um, or was it intended to be in all of them, that we would kind of take the best 18? I just, that word caught my attention, and I wondered the if there was something it behind it. The best was put in there to use the entire property, so the best 27 holes we have, creating 18 out of that. Yep. Okay. I have a question. Sure. And I apologize, I'm not a golfer, so my question may seem very simplistic, and, but I'll ask it anyway. So we have a lot of golfers who like to play nine holes. You said we have about 27,000 rounds last year. And Correct. so now we're going to an 18-hole course. Does that still accommodate people who only want to play nine holes on an 18-hole course? Well, wh what we're seeing right now is those nine hole rounds are on the 18 hole golf course as we speak. So they're already there playing the 18 hole golf course. Um, they're not playing the Clooney nine. It, we're having trouble getting people to play the Clooney nine. There's times we are trying to offer incentives to some of our leagues just to go over there for a one day so we can rotate things out. So it's, it's a matter of a lot of those rounds are already playing the 18 hole golf course. But if you're going to be upgrading and making the 18-hole golf course better, are you still going to be able to accommodate people? We'll still do that, and it's, it's a matter of programming. Um, we want those leagues out there. You put them out there uh, first thing in the morning. You do them in the evenings, so where you can double up uh, on your utilizations in the morning. It's just a man matter of managing where you put those rounds. But there, it is still available to be there. So I had a similar question because looking at the 27-hole versus the 18-hole option and the bullet points, it does say that an 18-hole option would force staff to financially favor 18 holes over nine, and we'd likely lose most of these golfers. And so is that it? Am I missing the timeline on this? Um, that, that's one of the task force observations. Okay. I, I don't necessarily agree with that. I don't think we're going to lose those golfers. Um, I think it's just a matter of managing them. Okay. But it's just it's two ways of looking at it. I mean, that's one of the the, the task force has their own recommendations within this. Uh, um, I don't play golf either. So, many questions, so but. 
I don't think uh, you mentioned what particular option that you prefer. Um, right now, I, I, I'm just trying to differentiate between the 18 and the 27. Um, if it was my money, I would say the 18 hole option without, you know, uh, going into the, uh, the minimal uh, disruptive ones and without doing a uh, additional uh, practice loop. Financially speaking. Now, if we wanted to have that practice loop as an amenity, I think it's a great idea. I think it would do very well, but that's up for you and the city council to decide whether we want to keep that portion of the property as for golf use. Um, but it, I, I don't see it as being a big money maker. Who do you think would use the four four hole practice? Loop? Oh, I think it would be used Everybody? heavily. Or um, more kids or more it would be, seniors? Uh, or? I would say the, the high schools would be out, out there quite a bit. Mm -hmm. I would see. Um, the people who just want a quick, not a round of yeah. golf, but just a, a quick outing of golf. Okay. Um, I can see that being used very heavily. I just don't see a return yeah. on the investment as much. It's more of an amenity to your uh, uh, constituents. Okay. So I, um, I kind of want, want to speak a little bit to the, um, the 18 that's not that does not uh, go into the oak savanna. Okay. Um, and I don't know if has any has the rest of the park board <coughs> actually gone out to see what that looks like. Mm -hmm. I think many of you know what that looks like. It's a gorgeous area um, that's natural, and um, if we were to do option, I think it's six with. Um, four, okay, option four, we would be cutting uh, a swath, just get me right, 60 feet wide and then at least 500 yards, maybe more? Uh, yes, it's, it's going up into that hill. It's a fantastically designed golf hole. I think it would be a, a great golf hole, but it's up for the, your decision and the city council of whether the you know what, they want to go up into that area. But I, uh, Richard, basically, he put this, these plans together to design the best possible product he could do going forward. So he wanted to use the entire footprint of the, of the property. And that's the reason he decided that that hole would be that much better if he went up into that hill. Now, if that's something the city wants to do in the future, that would be up to the city to decide. But it's just a recommendation just to get the best golf hole and the best golf experience you could find out at Braemar. Okay, so I, 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 the, the piece, I, I've walked up there, and it, there is quite a bit of elevation change. So as we talk about the Clooney being um, difficult for elderly players, I would recommend that that be considered as not necessarily an improvement. Actually, it's quite a bit. It's, I believe, the highest. Oh, it's the highest peak on the property. It's the highest peak, so I don't, I don't understand why that would make sense um, to add onto the golf course. From a des design perspective, it's, it's a very good golf hole that he's designing. Whether it's the best use of the property, that's a different question. But I think the golf hole itself would be very nice. From an environmental standpoint, it would be a disaster. Um, and uh, there's there are trails there, and I think um, I just want to speak to the the needs assessment that has been done um, because we have to look at these <coughs> this property not just as it's not just the golfers that could use the entire Bramer. So this is changing the use of the park that is that will affect the neighborhood that is currently using that as a trail. Um, the needs assessment, the f number one thing is that we, that residents all state is that they would like additional trails, particularly additional natural trails. So, um, and if I recall, I don't know where golf came on that needs assessment, but it was not anywhere near as high. Um, and so I would, I would listen, I'm, I'm taking my guidance from what the residents have said to us, and I would recommend that we do not increase the footprint of the golf course into 
that area. Are the plans to improve the trails in any one of the options or all of the options or are they weighted or lumped towards? Um, that's where the, the next step would be going into, okay. into Braemar master plan for the entire park area. Okay. Um, Richard did put some uh, trails back through there, okay. but okay. they're, they're not far. that far designed out. Okay. It would be something that we would have to do in the future. So regardless of what choice you'd make, you'd also enhance trails? likely in the future. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. That's okay. something we definitely want to do. We want to make it a year-round facility. Mm -hmm. um, Ten Fish opened up yeah. just recently and, mm -hmm. you know, it had very good response to that. We want people coming to that property mm -hmm. all throughout the year. So it's definitely going to be anything we're doing out there, it's going to be increase its uses. Okay. Yeah, I think it's a great trail. I hadn't really ever been there before and it's beautiful. Yes. I think all of his plants have some sort of, of trail built into it. It's just mm -hmm. not mapped out as, okay. as far as or as advanced as we'd like it right okay. at this point. And so um, uh, the staff recommendation is option number five. Um, and so tonight it, you're looking from the park board for a motion to support one of these options? Is that what we're doing tonight? I think what, what's going to work best is and what the council's looking for is we're going to do what I did maybe two, three months ago on, a, on an item where we're going to take a roll call vote. You can state your opinion. Um, it's less of a vote and more of a just stating your opinion and having any comments that you wish to deliver so that the uh, council can weigh those and we're going to handle it like that. So. Oh, okay. Well, then I'll wait until that time. And I think it was, it was very good with Ellen's uh, comments. Uh, stating what direction you guys are, are looking to go in the future. We're, we're not telling you or, or saying that you have to vote on it tonight. We're looking for your comment and your feedback. So um, could you tell me how um, part of what we're, we're trying to accomplish here is to be able to afford um, any kind of renovations. And I, I couldn't find in the report what it would cost for that seven million dollar for approximately what is a bonding cost for seven million dollars what would be the well it was factored into the the proformers i thought that the proformers were only operating costs no it, it does factor in what the debt will be and ellen that information is in the ellers report contained within the uh within the packet um, it goes into great detail of uh, all the costs for bonding. I it's attachment C. We've got we've got a number of folks that are going to present some more information concerning this particular subject. So maybe we should do that, and uh, we'll have some more question time later on. So, um, so Joe, I think uh, that's great for you. Unless you have anything else to add. Well, let you sit down, and uh, next up is going to be Brenda McCormick, who is on the, the task force, and, and she's going to uh, present to the board. Okay, thank you. Uh, one thing I wanted, or Ann asked, if I would just give you some of the information on the financials, because I did dig into that quite a bit, because uh, I had the same questions that you did. If you have 27 holes, why wouldn't you have more revenue? And that was really driving the financials. And so what... I think it's important for everybody to be grounded on what those assumptions were. So the current golf course has a capacity of 80,000 rounds. The most we've ever done at that golf course is 67,000 rounds, and that's when it was at its peak. And so the likelihood of us getting above 67,000 rounds is pretty unlikely. I mean, it could happen, but in the current state of golf, it's probably not likely. So we overbuilt several years, you know, 20 years ago with the Clooney 9, we never used, we never really needed that capacity. So that's important to realize. Also, they did a study in 2011, the National Golf Foundation for the city, and they did, um, they did reiterate that as well. They said if you actually go in and put any capital into this site, don't expect any increase in rounds. They also said do not expect to be able to get an increase in pricing. Okay, so those are the assumptions that Joe was using, and I think they make sense based off of the study that was done. The other thing about that study, so it would be important for you to know, is most of the items that they recommended, the city has been putting in place. So there were some key recommendations in that study, and over the last several years, those things have been actually acted on. So 
um, I think it was a very worthwhile study. The other thing is um, that I was surprised to see is the cost reduction that you can have with the 18 holes versus the 27 holes because I thought there would be more leverage. You know, you'd be able to share those costs. But because of just the groundskeeping and the fertilizer and just how expensive it is to maintain a golf um, hole, uh, you get a 10% reduction in the cost. So that's what's really driving the benefit between the two. So the revenue is the same, but the cost structure is actually quite a bit lower. And uh, those are all things that uh, Joe has been able to model, and he could answer any questions you have on those particular assumptions. And those are what we're taking for our financials. The other thing that I think it's important to know is that there is an irrigation system in the capital numbers. It's about $2.2 million. And that's factored in both of them. And regardless if we do anything, we have to replace the irrigation. So the $2.2 million is sort of a cost of maintenance that we need in, at that facility. So even if we decided to do nothing at the facility, that, that would have to be done. On the irrigation system, I noticed on um, the charts that uh, Joe had, there was a, a, a long um, uh, distance, or the range for useful life of the irrigation system. Why? I think it was like between 10 and 30 years. I mean, it was just a big, long range. Why, why would an irrigation useful life vary that much? how long you want to try to stretch it out. Uh, if, you, if you shorten that time, you're going to put less labor in. If you stretch it towards 30 years, you're, you're just chasing your tail around replacing your irrigation parts continuously. And we're up, up to that point. Most of, uh, most of the course was uh, put in 1979. So we're at that point right now where it's a lot of labor. The answer is the same for a lot of the different infrastructure golf course items because the useful life had such big ranges on many of the things. Yep, and some of it is aesthetic. So tees, uh, you know, what's the useful life of a tee box? If you play a, an updated golf course and you have a better experience, what makes it a better experience? It's the tee boxes are new and fresh looking and in better shape. You know, the cart paths, all those things add up to a better experience. Thank you. Uh, the other thing I was just going to mention are the increases that uh, we're assuming in the model. So it's a 1% increase on the pricing side, so on a revenue perspective, which is pretty conservative, but it does line up with what the, the National Golf Foundation suggested. And the, the cost is actually increasing at 2%. So in that model, you could say at least we should maybe have them going at the same rate, 2% increase in cost, 2% in revenue. But at least it's consistent in both of the different models. So you can compare those two numbers pretty easily. The other thing um, that I wanted to mention is we're trying, you know, the other thing that's happened at this course is that we haven't maintained it. That's really why we're at, at this stage that we are. And so I look at it as well, the 18 hole allows us to have some cash flow here that we can put back into the maintenance of the course so we're not in the same situation in, you know, another 30 or 40 years. Um, so those were the key observations on the financials. I feel pretty comfortable with the assumptions that he made and they're backed up by this, uh, a, a third party study. Um, so is there any questions for me on any of that? Okay. That was a great recap. <laughs> Thank you, Member McCormick. That was helpful. Uh, next, we're going to have uh, members of the task force other than Brenda that wish to uh, speak. Uh, please step forward. And maybe it looks like Paul wants to uh, be first. And please uh, state your full name and uh, lend us any comments that you care to share. Uh, good evening. My name is Paul Prestis. I'm a member of the task force, and I uh, appreciate the opportunity to talk with you this evening. Um, the mission of the task force when it was formed was to recommend the best possible master plan golf course option and for the renovation of Braemar Golf Course. The plan should, when done, should offer an accessible, playable, and affordable golfing experience for golfers of all ages and abilities in an enjoyable and friendly atmosphere now and in the future. One of our primary goals um, for the renovation was to position Braemar Golf Course as a premier destination golf course for local and regional golfers with priority opportunities for local for Edina residents. 
As Joel Abood mentioned, what we did um, that Richard Mandel put together a number of options at the task force requests, and six of those are still on the on the uh, table or under discussion. I'd like to talk to you about um, two of the options. Um, I think that the, and that would be options number one and number four. Number one is the best 27 hole option. And number four, I characterize it as the best 18 hole option. Either of these options are, um, would add tremendously to the golfing experience at Braemar and position us competitively to compete with anybody in the uh, metro and regional uh, uh, metro and regional area. I personally initially was favored the 27 hole option. I thought we had a unique oppor uh, unique is probably the wrong word, but a special opportunity to position Braemar competitively in this area with 27 holes that, um, that uh, uh, would differentiate us from our competition and it would also address the uh, access issue. There have been a lot of talk about access and you can place different emphasis on it, what you might be. I play golf, I've been involved in uh, uh, helping to operate golf courses and in renovation type projects. And, and uh, I think that what we're going to see with a newly renovated Braemar golf course is a increase in the golfers that are going to come here. There's a lot of reasons that uh, over and above what went on in the national scene why golf has suffered. And that's in the process of being corrected. You have to realize that golf, like a lot of things, is cyclical. It comes and goes. There's a lot of, there are, there are a lot of golfers that take up golf on an annual basis. There are a lot of golfers that leave. But I think with, with uh, promotion and, uh, excuse me, and better operating procedures and management that you can, uh, that you can drive participation. With 27 holes, you also uh, won't just have the opportunity to accommodate the uh, daily fee golfer, but also to go after the um, um, uh, outside events that can be very, very helpful to your bottom, to your bottom line. And so I really, f emphasizing the access part of it, really thought that the 27 hole options should be given serious consideration at least and really felt that there was a tremendous opportunity. Yes, there's more risk. Yes, there's more cost, but there's also more upside in my opinion and the opinion of others. Um, as of last week, we had a meeting, a work session with the uh, city council and some of you from the park board were there as well. And let me back step, let me take a step back just here to say that when we looked at, when we were evaluating the various options and what we're doing, we used primarily three criteria. The, the broad outline would be golf, uh, environmental, and financial. It became very clear at the work session that financial was a key part, you know, covering the costs and doing that. And um, it's only good use, and the city has to consider that. There are more costs initially with 27, and there are more ongoing costs, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, with, uh, with, the, with the 27. But there's also an opportunity. But it's tough to say. It's tough to, it, you can't be factual. It's, it's a we believe. We've got examples where things have worked out, where people have built it up. I don't think you'd even consider doing 20 soul, 27 holes or a renovation if you didn't think you could grow. We're doing X number of rounds now on a golf course badly in need of prepare without a lot of promotion. And uh, uh, so I think that there's a, there's a big upside there. But the financial concerns really, 
they were ir irrefutable in my estimation. And as I looked at that and looked at it from the city perspective, I started to change my mind and I basically changed my mind to go and to favor the 18 hole option versus the 27 hole option. Primarily for financial considerations and the fact that there is less risk and more, um, more uncertainty uh, to the 27. And I think that, I think that with proper management and good management practices that we can, uh, we can uh, satisfy the need, uh, come close to satisfying the accessibility needs. It's not, we're not going to be able to get that answer. We're not going to be able to find out until we say, oh, and the other thing about 27 holes, if you don't, you know, what you do now you're, you're, is baked into the cake. We're not going to be able to change it. We're not going to be able to go from 18 back to 27 or whatever it is. This is our one last opportunity to do that and preserve that type of thing. But, but I understand, and I think it's, uh, I think it's important enough, and uh, what came through loud and clear from the city council is that it's top of their radar. And so if we're going to evaluate um, these different options, we have to be both practical as well as, uh, uh, as well as optimistic looking ahead. So after that, in terms of recommending the, uh, or moving to the 18 hole, what we had with Richard Mandel was two outstanding options in the 27 and 18 hole. And the best, he was offered, somebody asked a question about what the best was. When Richard gave us very op various options, we asked him, then went back to him to say, give us your best. Don't take what we say. You know, you've listened to people, you know that. From your experience, what you think you can do with the property, give us your best options for 27 and 18. And that's, and that's what he did. And the 27 hole concept was one of three equal nines. Uh, it's tough to get rid of the Clooney name, and the Clooney connotation is not the most positive in the community. And three equal nines uh, is a concept that you'd have to buy into, but he went to great lengths to be able to do that and to look at that. With the 18 hole, what he did was he said that that gave him an opportunity to create an 18 hole regulation golf course that would have four to five holes of the best holes, not just in the metro, metro area, but in the whole region. That, that is why, because of the land that he'd have at his disposal and what he could do, he could create such a course. And again, that feeds into the utilization and how it's, how it's going to be. So I and others on the task force uh, not all, but uh, others have a great deal of confidence in Richard Mandel and what he says. He's somebody that, uh, uh, he's, he's very grounded, he's a minimalist, but he, can, he sees property and he can get excited and he knows, how, he knows how to make a golf course work. What he did over at Keller has received rare, uh, rave reviews and they are operating at a uh, a utilization figure that they never experienced in the past. So, you know, he, he, he's capable of these things, and that's what gives me the confidence to look at either of the options. But at the end of the day right now, I would recommend uh, or endorse the 18-hole option because of the financial concerns, but you have two wonderful options to consider here based on the work done by uh, Richard Mandel. Thank you. Well, Paul, if you'll remain, we might have a couple questions for you. Oh, sure. I'm, I, for one, am interested in, uh, I know you've, and thank you for your service, you've put a lot of hours into this, and well, I'm sure you, you have uh, you know, a Appreciate great perspective, it. and hopefully you'll welcome some questions from me. Yeah. Um, what, what are your opinions on the four-hole practice loop? Um, <clears throat> Just generally on the thing, that I, I believe that what's the best plan is to, for the city to make a selection of which option you're going to have, 18 or 27 hole first, okay? 
Richard's done some things, uh, you know, some trails and to do and looked at some other options. And we've talked about both golfing and non-golfing type options for that for that area. Um, four holes. Uh, if we didn't have the uh, the the par three, I'd say that's a great idea. Um, the four holes, you're not going to be able to get any revenue out of it. So I think that, you know, it sounds a little bit quirky to me, okay? <laughs> Given that, that, that's how I would do it. I, uh, it's worth considering, but I think as an alternative to the, to the four hole that we have opportunities to do um, a lot of short game practice facility type things that can be welcome to go with a, what is gonna be a state of the art uh, driving range and and other things there and we've got the ability on some of the other golf options such as a three hole green uh, three green uh, configuration where people could be uh, working on sand game chipping, chipping putting, putting. it'll be it would be it would be maintained to the same <laughs> level that the uh, the course would be and that type of thing and it could probably accommodate let's say around it could accommodate like eight people. And you could charge like $10 an hour for those people to do that because it is a special experience and it's, it, it is, it's being done other places in the country and it offers an option. So we have to do some creative thinking to get to look at these, but those would be some of the op opportunities that we'd like to look at. Because if we can generate some revenue out of those non-golf course type uh, uh, amenities that we're going to put on the course, it, everybody's going to benefit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't know, I'm a little bit dodging the, the four hole. It's not a favorite of mine, yeah. but I'm not dead set against it either. Okay. And one more question. Last question I'd like to pose to you is you, uh, you said four for an 18 hole option, option four for the 18 hole option. Right. Um, what about option five? Well, mm -hmm. What it gets down to for me is simple, that we asked and Richard gave us his best 18-hole option, okay? And that's what it was, and that's what I'm going with. Uh, uh, we have the land to do it. We have the cap whether we have the, um, uh, the mindset to do it or to, to, to enter into the, into the uh, Oak Savannas or Oak Woodland, that's for somebody else to decide, you know. But Richard responded to that. Um, option five would is, is going to be something to consider. But I I believe that you shoot for the best and seek that. If you have to adjust, then so be it. So that's that would be my answer. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And that's and that's valuable for me to hear. Thank you. Great. Yeah, I've got a Thank you. couple. Okay. Go ahead. Excuse me. No problem. I appreciate your insight, insight on the four hole. You sound like you're probably a regular golfer and I imagine a pretty good one. Uh, one time, but not anymore. Okay. But. As a regular golfer, let me be a bit more direct. Would you use the four hole practice round? Uh, not probably, uh, probably not. Okay. At this stage, you yep. know, and would it be right in golf today? One thing is, is irrefutable that with the state of golf and what it's gone through, golfers, people that are considering golf are looking for an option to an 18 hole round, yep. okay? I mean, golf is difficult, it's expensive, and it takes a long time, okay? So that's the that's downside. Some people, people that love golf, I mean, they could be out there, they'll go out there for 36 holes, let's put it that way. But there are, People are looking for options, and that's why the nine-hole golfer is so important, and you've got to address them. You're not going to do it because you will lose those. You don't satisfy the nine-hole golfer, they will walk. They'll go someplace else because that's the time slot yep. uh, they're, they've got committed to themselves and to do that. So it, 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 it's, it's there, but I, uh, uh, I, I probably wouldn't. Okay. I probably wouldn't. Use I'm, I might take my grandson over there to sure. do something like that. But. Sure. So then the, the other flip side of that is, as I understood it, if they put the four-hole loop in, 
the other, the regular 18, is shorter. Would that impact your view on that particular course if it were a little bit shorter? That's a very good question, and I'm going to answer it, answer it this way. Um, we've got to appreciate that what's going to go happen under whatever option we go with, that you're going to have uh, new tees, sets of tees, anywhere from five to seven sets of tees on each, on each hole. You're going to have widened fairways. You're going to have uh, fewer, if any, forced Forced, uh, forced carries and 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 that thing. So you've got, you've got to get. Um, uh, I just said what, what was it? You, you said. The distance. the distance that it's a shorter distance would that distance, impact yeah. your view yeah. of the course? So uh, that's why I started with the tees. What we've tried to do here, in terms of providing all these options, is provide a challenging opportunity for golfers of all abilities. If we do the 18 as proposed, we can have a 7,000 yard from the tips, so, as they say, okay? And that is going to appeal to your younger, better golfers. <laughs> the equipment is such that, you know, they render these things almost obsolete, uh, the, the, the way it goes. And it, to the, it, it's not essential, it's not going to change the character of the golf course, but it just gives you more flexibility in terms of doing that. So the, the distance that you can have, the number of people there is going to be very few that are going to be playing that, but it's nice to have that option, and there are certain events that you can have. Any other questions, comments from the board? No? Okay. Well, thank, thank you, you, Paul. Appreciate, Appreciate it. it. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Joe, I want to ask you one quick question before we get to someone else. Paul had brought, mentioned, I don't think it's been talked about too much, is corporate activity. Okay. And revenue generation from that. Yes. What's the potential? There is a lot of potential, and it's, it goes back to how we manage the rounds that we presently have. Um, we don't have a lot of opportunity there right now based on the way we have it programmed out. That would need to change in any scenario going into the future. But there is a lot of potential for uh, corporate outings that do generate a lot more revenue than your daily fee golfers which help keep the, the greens fees down for your daily golfers. Are we l potentially losing out on that with a, a ch choosing 18 over 27 holes? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, I think uh, we're still going to have to limit it to certain days of the week based on the amount of the, the league schedules that we have. Um, so we really don't have an opportunity to do it if we keep the programming that we have in place. Um, for some of the Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. But if we get to the Monday, Fridays, where the, the premium outings will be, uh, we can benefit from that. So, I mean, we can change the programming in any scenario. So, but I, I think it's something that we can still capture better than we're doing now in the future. Right. I guess just one thought about the four-hole option, adding that on. Um, what are the pros and cons of doing that? So with respect to, like, corporate outings, is a four-hole option of more benefit or is it more detrimental and also from the high school standpoint are you helping foster new golfers by having more options like that i think it helps uh with junior golf to have the different options i don't think it'll 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 uh give us a better uh market advantage on any of the corporate outings with the four hole loop but i think it's it's always good for junior golf to have more practice areas to get the kids out on the golf course without a, a high cost to it very much opinion on that fact, but it's my my understanding that with the economic downturn and the addition of so many other alternative things for the youth to do in the last 10 years, right, from yes. Frisbee golf to, you know, it goes on and on, would it be beneficial potentially to have that four-hole loop to bring in, you know, non-18-hole uh, folks and say you can get it introduced to the game with that and, and with some different things we can do besides having 27 holes. Is that, is that fair to say or not, not so much? Yeah, it, it will definitely draw people in. It's not going it's, it's to be huge. We have an extremely good junior, junior program already. It's one of the largest in the state. Um, so we do have a, a, a good program, and we could have a very good feeder system. We have a great under-25 rate that uh, a lot of people are utilizing. So we, we have a good system to feed what we presently have. It's whether we can gain it or go to that next level is, is the question. I, I mean, it's, hard, it's just hard to answer, especially in the golf industry where 
you don't know what's going to happen. I was, the, some of the brightest minds in golf <laughs> can't can't say what's going to happen two years from now. So. Yeah, and that's part of the discussion. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. I think we have at least two others uh, from the uh, task force. And I think we have Pacey here. So please introduce yourself. And uh, my name is Pacey Irk, and I started at Braemar Golf Course in 1964, July 22nd. I was behind the counter, and I think the only person that's going to remember the hills that we had to go up for one in ten is Ken Roslin. Literally, you had to go up high, high hills, and you're hitting off a high hill. Do any of you remember that at all? That was a test. Uh, anyway, the excitement with this is being on this board, and I think the, f the first thing that happened is the implication is that we were to really be addressing 27 holes. I mean, 18 wasn't even in the picture, and that, that came in about a month or two months later, and I and, I, and I'm very much for 18. I think you, could, you would have been a win-win with 27. There's no question you would have been win-win. And you can be a win-win with 18. And I certainly respect the financials, you know, with total wines and all the things that are happening in our city and what you're having to look at. Also, the problem we're here because we didn't sustain the golf course for 50 years. We weren't doing and keeping it up, which is now we know we need to do that. So we need to have the money. Um, I'm a lot like Paul. Um, I like to stretch. Richard has put a lot of work into this whole process. And I just don't want to see us do a Band-Aid fix. This is an opportunity. It kind of goes back like 66 West. You have to take sometimes risk, take a chance, and try to make it the best you can because you're going to be stuck with this for another 50 years. So I'm only here to support you, and I know it's a very, very tough thing, but I'd really like not to see it just be a Band-Aid, that it's something that we are extremely proud of as a community, and you are as a park board, and our city has had, you know, for people to come in here. So it's a toughie. Good luck. Uh, Pacey, one quick question for you, though. What, what option <laughs> would you uh, grace us with, with your opinion on the option? Going, going with 18, I mean, my number one would have been 27. Because I really wanted to play that 23. I wanted that challenge. Um, I would actually be going with option four. I, I like, um, I, I've gone up into the woods, and I, I think the sad thing for me up there is all of the brush that has literally overgrown even those savanna trees. I mean, savanna trees are supposed to come right down to the ground. None of the branches to the ground because there's so much buckthorn and everything else. We haven't taken care of it. We may still love it, but we honestly haven't taken care of it to, you know, when we sit and say it's beautiful. It's not as beautiful as it should have been if we'd taken care of it. But thank you. All right. Last and maybe least, former park board member, former chair, introduce yourself, please. This doesn't apply to me, right? <laughs> Joseph Hulbert, 7507 West Shore Drive. Um, I just have to say I'm thrilled to be here. I, um, I never thought that uh, like five years ago when we were up here and kind of starting to talk about this issue that we'd ever be at a point where we'd be looking at something like this. So it's really exciting. And thank you guys all for your hard work and time that you put into it, and particularly staff for their dedication to uh, these types of matters for our park system and the hard work. and the tough decisions that they make sometimes. So um, for me personally, coming into this, I thought it was just automatic that we'd be looking at a 27-hole rerouting. And when they came back with the original designs, I saw that 18, and I just kind of thought, wow, wouldn't that be cool? You know, but um, it, it didn't, for me, start to happen until later when we were kind of digging into the financials. And... Uh, and I was out there golfing, and it really kind of struck me that a lot of these things are so overdue. And you look at that slide, and um, some of these things should have been repaired 20, 30 years ago. And it just, you know, a course that is dependent on or is likely to have subsidy from the city is, is destined to slowly fail. And I don't think that's anything any of us want to be a part of. We want to correct this, you know, if... If we had had the opportunity to go back 20 years ago and not build that Clooney 9, which was built with good intentions, but to not build it and to just 
use that money to reinvest in this course, we probably wouldn't even be having this conversation. Um, so uh, I, uh, I've got a few things I just kind of jotted down here, so I apologize. And if uh, I'm keeping you here too long, I apologize for that too. But I sat there many times. And, uh, um, so we should be striving to fill this tea sheet. If we fill this tea sheet and you roll in there on a Saturday at 11 o'clock and you can't get a tea time, that's a good problem. We're doing it right. Um, it should be hard to get on this course. And I've said this time and time again, if we do this, we need to go back to the way it was 20 years ago and, and have a patron card, a resident patron card, that if we want to talk about accessibility, the people that are going to pay for this renovation are going to be the ones that have priority access to it. If we go through all this trouble, and the people that are have trouble getting on this course in three years, if we redo it, we'll hear from it. We need to get back to doing that again. Um, you know, there might be some people, myself included, that want to go out and play nine holes that might not be able to get on when they want to get on. But um, this isn't a bobsled track. There's not. There's more than two of them. Um, there's nine hole courses. There's 18 hole courses all around the metro. I like playing all over the place. I don't play the same course all the time. Um, I'm excited about option five when I when I look at it. <clears throat> um, although I am sad that up in that hill, it does seem that that area has been kind of neglected. Um, I think we as a community need to get invested in there and, and clean that up and, and utilize that more um, for trails or whatever it might be. Um, all of Richard's plans call for an increase, even options one, even option four, call for an increase in, in new plantings and creating oak savannas for future generations. So everything that this task force has done has been with intentions to improve the environment at this golf course. We're conservationists. We want to have a beautiful course to play. We don't want to just cut down trees. Um, <clears throat> uh, I supported the, the, the closing of the, of the FRED because I, I felt that there was a necessary give and take, and this is the opportunity to get back, and this is overdue. Um, regarding the, uh, the four-hole practice loop, I personally think it's a waste of, of, of parkland and, and, uh, and money. Um, if you want to learn how to play the game of golf, you start on the putting green when you're a little kid, or, and then you move to the driving range, and then you move to the par three, and then you move out onto the regulation course. If we're building a four-hole practice loop and taking all that space and, and spending a million dollars, I think there's other things that we could do with that land. Um, one thing that I would encourage some people to look at is that uh, I said this before too, but at Golden Valley Country Club, they have a little three-hole loop, and it's not like regulation 400, 450 yard, 500 yard holes. It's just little 40, 50, 60 yard little pitch and putt holes, and it's adjacent to the parking lot. And it's a great place for a junior that wants to try to golf before they get to a par three. I think it would be a great little amenity and it wouldn't take a lot of space. So. Um, I guess in conclusion, I'm, I'm, like I said, I'm excited to be here. I support option, option five. Um, we have an 18-hole course, potential course, that would be stretching out its legs from an 18-hole framework to existing 27-hole framework, and it'd be awesome. Joe, so. why five and not four? <clears throat> why five and not four? Mm -hmm. um, It's a change of use in that hill. I, I don't think we need to go into that hill to, to create a, a, um, a spectacular 18-hole routing. Um, I don't believe the will from the, the, the public is there to do that either. Um, and uh, like I said, I, I think there are other uses that we could use in, in, that, in that area too, biking, walking. Uh, it shouldn't be left the way it is. I mean, I, I agree it's pretty, but it, 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 it needs help. It's become overgrown. I mean, those oak savannas aren't regenerating themselves anymore. They've got to be managed. And um, in 100 years, those trees might not be there. It could just be buckthorn and cottonwood. And the only oak trees that will be around will be the ones that we plant with this project through Richard. So... Yeah, I agree. It's an underused jewel. And uh, it's something, when we take a bigger perspective, a big picture, strategic look at it as a park board... That's land that we can, a lot of ideas have been bending about, uh, mountain biking paths and walking paths. And it's the surveys we do, everyone says we want some more natural areas and some paths. 
that's something we can take a look at with that. So there's probably some other uses for that. Um, and then again, that's all part of the discussion. So. All right. Any other comments, questions for? I hope your cold gets better. Joseph? Thank you. It's allergies. <laughs> I share. I, I'm a sufferer myself. It's nice to see you all. Yes, same. Thank you. All right. All right. I think. Is there anyone else? Did you have some more? No. I no? All right. Anyone else? I think that's all that uh, we're looking to come up and speak. Yeah? Okay, sure. Bob Coteen, live at 5016 William Avenue. I guess I'm one of the only ones that were really left in 1962 when we studied the golf course to build a golf course. When we got the money from the state legislator to pass the Edina bill, which gives us the opportunity to have revenue bonds. Um, I did a lot of research with Ken Roslin and us going to all the golf courses. We were talking about, I want to give you a little bit of information maybe on history more than what we did. Uh, we wanted to build a golf course that was between the Minneapolis Public Golf Course and the two golf courses in Edina which were private. How do we find an area in between? And that's how we went to Braemar. We had a, an area, our first design was to take the whole 140, 445 acres. We ended up with 320 acres because we thought we could do something with the other outside. Uh, the original golf course and the plan, we had a road that completely circled the golf course. The south end has always been bad soil. So that was eliminated from the original bill. But we wanted to do something with path. And when we built the Clooney course, the Clooney course was really an was a push from the good golfers in the city. They said the original 18 wasn't tough enough for the good golfers. How do we make a good golf course that would co cover the good golfers? And the young golfers were the ones that had the stimulation to push us to do the Clooney. I always remember sitting in those meetings when we were doing the design, they said, this is really a tough golf course. And we had a lot of irrigation and a lot of uh, problems with the environment because we had to go, we had to work with the Corps of Engineers. We had a design and the Corps of Engineers said, you can't do this, you can't do that. And they had a new person that came out of Chicago and says that, who was in the Corps of Engineers says, we can't build that golf course and use this property because it's still environmental and you have to have certain rules. And so she says, build a seven-hole golf course. And if you don't build a seven-hole golf course, you're not going to get approval for permits. And so everybody said, a seven-hole golf course? Golf is for nine holes. <laughs> well, we finally, then she said, okay, what you have to do is find some other areas. So we went to Eden Prairie, and we went way out to Lakeville to look for, to build another golf course for Edina. And by going out there, we don't have to disturb this land. The land has always been on the south end. It's always been a questionable, as from the Nine Miles situation to the Corps of Engineers, that it was a wetland. The whole golf course originally was wetlands, except the center hole. And the ones on the fourth hole and on the west side, we used that terminal moraine, which was all the actual gravel that we covered over the whole golf course that we put over on top, and then we used the peat that we dredged out of all the 18 holes. Well, we only dredged 17 holes. 16 was never because there was no bottom, so we'd never done anything on 16. But because of these things, and when we built the Cooey, we said, okay, if we build the Cooey, we gotta put a path on the south end of the golf course. And also, on the east side, we have to go over the top of the hill. But in that, we had a lot of bridges. So we had to put two bridges over the Nine Mile Creek, but we never went to the east side to build pathways. And you talked about having paths. It would, so when we were doing that, we had the uh, dozers out there. I said, can you make a path, just go up through the top of the hill and come back down again, just so at least we have something there. We did make a path up there, but we aid zigzagging <laughs> to go back so we could, because it was so steep. But we still ended up 
having some kind of a path up there, which was never developed. And at the, on the east side, if you go down out there, you'll always see some of the area. We dumped a big pile of sand there so people couldn't use that because the, the motorcycles were going out there and going up and down a hill. So that's how we stopped it. And that kind of destroyed that path. But some way, uh, I'd like to see that path be continued so we have a continued path around the whole area. Because when we started back in the uh, running situation, when the people start running, they wanted to run around that path, run around Graymar. And that would have given us like a two mile run. But we didn't have, at that time, we didn't have, or, uh, didn't have Bredesen Park, which we built the path over there for running. But nobody ever used it as a running. They still wanted to go <laughs> down the Braymar. So those are kind of things that, when you take into consideration, as far as the golf course plan is concerned, uh, five, I've read it, I've read the plan. Uh, Louise gave me her plan, and I read the whole plan over uh, in the last couple of days. And, and it's, the golf course needs improvement. Through the last 50 years, all we've ever done is piecemeal. We didn't have the money. And I would like to see you running this time. If you do 27 or if you do 18, it's going to be an improvement out there. And I think another thing that we never took in consideration when we built Clooney, that at that time, the population that was used in Braemar was people over in my age that had started the golf course and started playing in 1964. But now when we built Clooney in the 90s, every one of those people were older. And so right away, they all formed and said, we're not going to play it because it's too... It's too tough. And the young people that wouldn't, uh, would play it, we didn't have enough of them. They were dropping off. So that 64% of our, of our population, Edina, at that time was seniors. And when you have that many in the seniors, they rebelled. So when you, then they called up, which a lot of you have heard, and they called them and said, uh, which, which hole do we start at? We, well, you're going to do Clooney today. They hung up just because of the fact that they, it was too difficult of a course, but it was built for the younger people who wanted a tougher course to play. And, that, uh, and that's never, and it's never materialized, and for 20-some years, that's what we've been having. So, uh, so. But I just thought that I'd give you a little history uh, on some of the things that have been gone through, because I sat in all of these things. Uh, maybe you might not know, I was a park director here, you know, for 20 years. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but I started in 1961, I retired in 1994. A lot has happened since 1994. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but I think that there's some history that should be really kind of looked at. And uh, in that pathway, uh, I think you'll get a lot of pressure because of the voting. People have voted that we want more running paths. It's going to be a tough golf course because you have to go up the, over the hills, but that could be another revenue uh, thing I think you can have different things out here. If you just heard about the figure skating and the hockey association, when you think about the figure skating had a program, was in January for synchronized swimming. They made something like around $100,000 for that nonprofit organization. Unbelievable. Could we have those big things for the golf course? They had to be able to run those uh, tournaments. But the original things that we talked about the original park board, original council, said we don't want any tournaments out there. We want it just for the Edina golfers. And that put a bit of block out. We couldn't run it. We had a Minnesota Open, and when the Minnesota Open was over with, they wanted to extend all the holes. We changed a lot of holes, never used them after that. And we never had any tournaments. We had a few afterwards from non, but nothing that would generate a lot of revenue, of course. So. With that, thank you very much. Well, Are there any questions? Yeah, Bob, I have a question for you. With your, with your special history. What? With your special history with the city and, and the whole scene, your voice carries a lot of weight. So I, what, you haven't voiced your opinion. If you, if you reviewed the materials, what option would you choose and why? I don't know. I think the 18 uh, and the number four, I think uh, what they had or the number five, they're both good options. Uh, I think at the time right now, if you, if you built the 27, it isn't that much difference in, in price, really, when you look at 
what is the debt retirement? You're looking at from 500,000 a year to 600, something like that. Uh, you know, the city isn't going to make that money to pay for that anyway, so the city taxpayer is going to have to come up and pay for that. The, golf, the, the liquor store isn't going to pay for it. All of our money that was made for all these years, the first 30 some years, was all made on the driving range. The driving range was the key to making money for the golf course. And the, and the regular golf course has never really made that amount of money. But the driving range, when you improve that, that's where everybody in the metropolitan area is going to come, because this is a close area. And you have to look at that as a money revenue thing that you have to do. Uh, so uh, I don't know if I answered, but some of that I think you have to look at. Uh, so anybody else have any questions? Okay, I sat, I sat on uh, a lot of park boards. <laughs> okay, thank you. Well, I think that concludes everyone who wishes to speak anyway. So, uh, and the next phase is, is discussion here amongst the members. And then we can maybe do a, a roll call vote. Uh, for those who aren't familiar with it, we've done it once or twice before, just to help the council and get it on the record to kind of go down and um, say whatever comments. If you just want to say, I like this option, or if you want to add some com comments, uh, something to help uh, lend some guidance to the council. So, but at this point, anyone have any, any discussion points? I, I had one thought, think, thinking of what else we still have on our agenda for tonight about our strategy. I'd, I'd be interested in hearing some thoughts from other board members. Are, is there any directive you can take from the work we've done on the strategy that would help us with this decision? I thought there was one clear direction, which was the enterprise facilities were supposed to pay for themselves was one of our key financial objectives. And so I think that helps us understand mm -hmm. which direction we might want to look at from a financial perspective. And that along with the walking trails, I guess for me, it's like we've got to invest in that, that site in general. Can, whether you choose four or whether you choose five, is kind of, it kind of depends on how good can you make the trails, how can you, are they compromised if you, you know, extend into that woods, or does it actually improve it? That's what I, I guess I don't understand enough about that option. The other thing I was considering was, um, as, because we do have that buckthorn issue a lot, really all over our parks, right? We really need a separate initiative on that. I don't know if the golf course in this particular hole should be the solve to that or if that should be something different um, in, a, in a different type of resource to look at that. Because I think um, some of the folks on the task force feel that will actually help that area because it would be maintained. Um, but I think that should actually fall under a different type of maintenance plan. Um, I, I couldn't hear um, what was being said, actually. Yes, um, I think that, that hole that's up in the woodlands, I think that should fall under uh, a lot of the, the work in our strategic plan on how we maintain our areas and manage the buckthorn and the other invasive species. And I was just saying that in some of the discussions we've had on the task force, they have, there's been discussion that perhaps putting a golf hole up there would actually be beneficial because it would be maintained at that point. And I think it should fall under our strategy, uh, and we should have a maintenance plan, which we, which we haven't had. So it would be fall under our, our park um, and rec process to maintain the area. Well, I... I the strategy from, from my reading of the strategic plan, especially uh, the, the sections that deal with natural resources, is that open areas and environmental uh, concerns of the community are high. And so putting a hole in cutting trees is not consistent with that. Uh, now, um, and putting a hole in cutting trees is different than maintaining the oak savanna and eradicating buckthorn um, so that the area shows the way it should show. 
but you know, I think I, I think I think we're ready to go around with comments. I I don't I don't I, I'd like to add more, but I I don't want to be repetitive. All right. I mean, that's that's fine as anyone else. I I don't want to close it down if someone has a discussion point they'd like other members to consider before they make you know we make final comments. So. I'll just mention, as, with respect to the uh, strategic plan, one of the pieces of that would be that all of our parks would have a master plan. And I do think that this goes hand in hand with how we would use the entire park so that um, thinking about um, putting in a, a, a par three, par four, four hole course, um, at this stage without thinking about, well, would that affect whether or not there would be a walking loop right there or whether a pitch and putt might be a more appropriate use for that space or some other function. I do think that strategically we like thinking in terms of our, our land in, as a master plan trying to fit all those uses together. And, and I might, since I asked the question, I'll give you an opinion as well. Um, I like the framework that Paul offered up from the task force that he said, you know, golf, environmental, and financial. But as I think about our strategic plan, I might flip those around a little bit and say I think our charge is to think financial, environmental, and golf. And yet still have a golf course that we're proud of as a community and that's better than what we have today. But that's what I kind of pull from our strategic framework that we're thinking about is we've got to answer to those first two. That's where our strat strategy is driving us and yet still have the best golf course we can have for Braemar. I think I would echo that. I would, I would hope as part of the discussion, part of the design um, with all the groups and their expertise working together that we can strike a, a pretty neat balance between those three. They're all important. So I hate to sacrifice, uh, you know, a spectacular golf course if we don't have to. Um, I'm an environmentalist as well. I, I, I lean against going into the woods or harming any trees if there's a real reason for it and we can replace those somewhere. I might be open to that as well, but uh, I think those three elements are, are the key. So, I think uh, that's probably all the comments. So Janet, maybe you can uh, call each name and uh, we'll give everyone <laughs> 60 seconds or whatever, and uh, or less, and, and state your case. We'll just start then with Member Jacobson and go all the way around. Sure. Okay. I like option five. I would, as part of the strategic plan, like to consider the, the woods land as one of many lands that we're going to talk about all across the city and just address that separately and try to optimize that golf course to be as great as it can be in the, the land that it's currently got. Um, when my family moved here in 1976, I recall hearing that uh, Braemar at that time, the golf course, was on a list of the 100 best public courses in the, in, in the United States. And, and so there is a part of me that says maybe we can't reach that again, but it's a great vision to have to kind of strive for for a golf course in our community. Uh, I prefer 18 over 27. I think the financial aspect of it uh, drives us in that direction. Um, and, and I prefer option number five over option number four because I think it's the most environmentally friendly. Uh, and uh, I've also had some avid golfers that I know say they favor a very strong 18-hole golf course over 27 that they really think that would be the best thing from a golfing community. So uh, those things all put together for me would say 18 holes and of the choices we have, option number five. Okay, I echo everything that you just said. I agree with um, uh, the ability to uh, be financially uh, prudent so that we will have money to reinvest in our golf and um, to reinvest in the rest of the parkland. So I would stick with an 18-hole. I would move to an 18-hole golf course. I would definitely keep within the footprint of um, the current golf course. Um, and uh, one of the reasons is that I would uh, 
like to consider the year-round usage of that park. And so making sure that we have the ability to have winter activity there that would um, uh, fit other people, whether it's uh, cross-country skiing or, um, or snowshoeing, um, but there's a lot of opportunity for that. Um, I would also recommend that um, once this piece gets settled, um, I would recommend that we do a master plan before the golf course is even designed because I think that that is, it's a, it's a puzzle that we need to figure out where all those pieces should go and what they may be. And I think that it would be a little bit, um, it, it would just not be logical to start and say, well, we're not going to go in one certain area. Um, and then you realize that that's the only place that a loop trail would go or something. I don't know. That would be my opinion. One thing I wanted to mention is I've been on this task force since last June, I think is when it started, and the passion and the amount of work that that team has put in has been really, really um, outstanding. And all of the members of the task force have really put all their best work into this. Um, so I just want everybody to recognize that. They've been meeting at least weekly, sometimes twice weekly, and it's been a lot of work. Um, I, I do tend to favor the 18 hole because I feel financially it's the right decision to make. And I also feel like we should be managing that woodlands area from an environmental perspective and not a golf perspective. So I, I, I tend towards, or I would recommend option five. I think it's the right thing for the course. It really improves the course. One thing that I was concerned about as well with the 27, and I know that the golfers on the, on the task force um, said it was a big enough change, but the Clooney 9 has such a stigma with it that I don't know that we were really going to be able to get over that hurdle anyways with the, the, with that back 9. Now, they, they felt we did, so and they're, they're much more in tune with the golfing piece, but from a financial perspective, the 18 fully, um, fully wins, and I don't see any reason that we would need to go up into the woods. So. All right, I'll keep mine short. I think my, my opinions are pretty well known out there. Um, and Ellen, did I catch, did you say option five was your choice? Okay, okay. Uh, and I, I would choose five at this point as well uh, for all the reasons that have been stated. The only thing I would add, I'd like to have a little more discussion, a little, little more look at um, maybe a pitch and putt. I think a neat little am amenity like that might be something that uh, with uh, the extra space that's um, there might be something that uh, we could take a look at. So. I think the financial um, presentation is such that it's difficult to support 27, especially if we need to put the maintenance costs into maintaining the golf course and keeping it where it needs to be, because that seems to be, from a historical perspective, something that we haven't done. So we need that money, and so it's clear that we need to go with the 18 holes. Um, I, at this point, I guess I would favor option five, just because we're not touching the hillside, but... The two plans, as I see them presented and everything that we've gotten so far, are presented to me from a golf perspective, what's best from a golf perspective. And I think Ellen has um, made a, a very, very good point that we need to have a master plan for Braemar from a park perspective. And so I would be willing to listen to what we could do from a park perspective with either option four or option five. And if it turns out we could do more with from a park perspective with option four, I would consider that. Um, and I just think that I can't really tell what's better from a park perspective because the plans are all drafted from a golf perspective. So that would be my caveat. But at this point, just with what's in front of me, I guess I would, on the environmental basis, stick with um, option five. An 18-hole option is the most uh, financially responsible uh, option um, to take. Uh, and as far as um, the difference between option four and five, I'm very much more in favor of option five, which is the staff recommendation, because as you all know, I'm, I'm really um, concerned about going into the hillside um, and I'd like the city council to be really very careful 
um, in uh, looking at these options with the labels that the golf consultant has been putting on the options. This is the best hole. You know, is it the best hole for the golfer or the worst hole for the environmentalist? Um, and I'd like the city council to step up and regard its uh, role as being uh, a steward of the land for future generations. Well, I agree um, on the 18 for the financial reasons that everyone spoke about. Um, not being a golfer myself, but knowing a lot of folks who are, I know that one of the things folks are concerned about with golfing generally is the environmental sustainability of it. And you went from 15 years ago, lots of mowed green space to, I think, a real trend to moving to more sustainable, more responsible golf courses, and people are looking for that. So I appreciate that it, it looks like that's the direction we're trying to go here. Um, but again, this was written mostly from a golfing perspective, um, and um, I guess I appreciate it looks like that's been taken into consideration, but I would hope it would be explicitly considered and I think it would be a benefit because um, I do think folks are looking at that when they are choosing courses now. And your option choice. Oh, I'm sorry, option five. All right, Janet, correct me if I'm wrong. It was uh, unanimous with option five. Yes, it was. Okay, okay well, I think uh, that concludes our dealing with this particular issue. Uh, Anne, you have something to add here? Yes. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you. I'd, I'd just like to weigh in and uh, say thank you very much to the task force as well. Um, Brenda um, stated very well the, uh, the hard work that the task force has put in in the last year. It has been tremendous. There were other members of the task force that weren't here tonight. Uh, Rick Itis was not here this evening. Um, and Dick Brozick were not here this evening, but Paul Prestis, Pacey Irk, Joseph Hulbert, and, uh, and Brenda served on that task force. The amount of time and effort that they put in um, was phenomenal. And, uh, and thank you so much, Joseph. Thank you for, uh, for your efforts. And uh, thank you, too, to the board. I know that this was a very difficult decision, and I appreciate all the time that you put in. Um, I know that everyone toured the site. Um, it really helped. Um, I think to uh, to really see uh, from both a golf and environmental and a park standpoint and uh, staff also feel strongly about uh, option five and we also feel very strongly about a master plan uh, for Braemar Park so and not just for the golf course property but for the entire property leading all the way up to uh, to Braemar Field and Courtney Fields you know we have a really tremendous asset and tremendous opportunity to tie that whole park together and do something really special. So, thank you. Agreed. Thank you, Ann. All right. If we haven't put Terry to sleep. <laughs> I think his eyes are, are open. Uh, we can move on to our next uh, item D, Park Recreation and Trail Strategic Plan. Is this good? There we go. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you for having us. Yes, it was very entertaining. Um, the only thing I could say would be a wild playoff game would have been more exciting to watch, but uh, <laughs> the park board meeting is awesome. So thank you for that insight. It's very insightful to see that because it does tie into a lot of the work we've done, and it's nice to see that you're referring to the strategic master plan moving forward with some of these uh, ambitious goals. So uh, thank you for having us. Um, we're uh, here to kind of go through the back end of the strategic plan, the implementation framework. Um, we will be willing to accept questions and thoughts and comments regarding the whole master plan document since that's what you've been provided with. But our intent here is to move forward and explain uh, the final end of it, the implementation framework. Uh, you've seen a lot of the body of the work previously. And hopefully from this, we can move forward with uh, final recommendations and revisions for approval on the, I think, 9th of June is what we're shooting for, and City Council approval on the 16th. 
Um, I have Jeff Bransford here with me tonight um, and Brad Aldrich from our office. So if you have any questions dealing specifically with uh, a lot of the uh, detailed work that Jeff has done, he'll be happy to ask some of those, answer some of those questions as well. Um, so within the implementation framework, um, we have you know basic introduction, uh, strategic plan vision, which we've revised through comment, and the mission statement of the park system. Um, then we developed the guiding principles. Um, you're all familiar with a lot of these guiding principles. There's a good in-depth description of which of them um, entails. Uh, I'll go through them quickly with you. Uh, promote community health and wellness uh, by engaging. This is really important um, throughout our committee meetings that uh, there's a strong theme of community health and wellness, um, connecting all the residents to the park system and encouraging them to get out and use the park system through programs and recreational activities. Provide excellence and innovation in the parks and recreation services to meet the needs of the community. That's one thing that came resoundingly forward through focus groups as well as internal meetings and uh, discussion through with yourselves and the committee was that Edina wants to remain an excellent uh, park system, not with only within the metro but throughout the state and throughout the nation. Um, develop creative funding opportunities and programming partnerships to ensure excellence in facilities programs and financial stewardship. This ties into the financial stewardship component where we can make all our uh, amenities and facilities within and programs within the park system financially viable and sustainable. Um, advance environmental stewardship and conservation to preserve and protect natural resources and build excellence through sustainability. This ties back to the environment as a whole. Uh, a lot of uh, ideas and initiatives were put forward that began to talk about how we do connect with nature, how do we preserve nature, how do we enhance the natural systems throughout the city of Edina. Connect residents to park facilities and their programs. Uh, this ties back into the connectivity of the community and uh, how people can get to the park systems, how they can be made aware of the programs within the park systems and the amenities that you have within the parks. Uh, promote social equity and engagement within the park system and its programs. This ties specifically to giving everybody the equal opportunity to be uh, partake in the facilities that Edina has and the programs that it offers. Now from those, we introduced uh, the purposes, the goals, and the strategies. We defined this previously as visions, but we felt it was a little confusing with the overall vision statement. We refined that, and we defined these overall guiding purposes that kind of lead you through the document and um, through key areas of development within the park system, uh, those being natural resources and sustainable parks, uh, parks, open space, and trails, recreational facilities, recreational programs, and finance and management. We've given a brief definition of what purpose, goals, and strategies are, and then the tactics that we use in implementation plan to bring those forward. Um, I'm not going to go through all of the individual uh, different areas of the uh, purpose and goals for um, natural resources, parks, programs, uh, facilities, and finances. But I'll just touch base on how this is framed and how it's brought forward. And I'm willing to accept any questions or comments you may have on some of these as I move through them. But the first one is uh, natural resources and sustainable parks. Uh, we have three different goals within here that we begin to talk about how we can begin to improve, protect, and enhance um, the natural systems um, within the parks. Um, and then from those, we have strategies. And then in the back, um, the appendix, we've identif identified the specific tactics that we use to accomplish those strategies. Is there any particular comments that you had with regards to the natural resources and sustainable parks section? I guess the, I just have one comment. Sure. As I was reading through the whole report, I mean, it's really well done. I, I, I really like it a lot. One thing that I started thinking about is that we have a very narrow view of, you know, a park is a park. But then we start talking about the, the woods on top of Braemar and, and looking at the creek. And, you know, we have a lot of land. And it's, it almost feels like we're getting so narrow that we just think about parks, but we have so much land and how to wrap our arms around that better. Right. In, in part of the document, we tried to identify some of those areas, those leftover woodland areas, mm -hmm. the edges to the creeks, um, whether it's the Nine Mile Creek or Minnehaha, the, how, mm -hmm. how those aren't necessarily considered Edina parks, but they are part of that overall system and how we can yeah. tie together yeah. um, some of those things. So maybe we can take a look at that and see how we can bring more of a focus to those sorts of things. Yeah. I asked Dan today again about power easements 
trying to see if we could begin to connect some of those trail opportunities through there. Sadly, I don't think a lot of them lend themselves to that just based on their location and some of the conflicts that they have. But I think you know, there are opportunities like that, like that out there that we can begin to connect to that aren't necessarily lands that are part of the park system. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, thank you for that comment. Okay. I notice in this section there's no mention about Bredesen Park, the, the wildlife area in the center of that. Is that um, something that we wanted to look into? Yeah, I don't know that it is called out anywhere specifically in the document. Is it, Terry? Uh, no, I, I'm trying to recall. I think we did have something at one time that specifically talked about an environmental center, but then we peeled that back a little bit, and that might be under a different section in here. I'm, I'll have to refresh my memory on it, but um, uh, we kind of steered away from that creation of an actual facility to may have more of just a staging point or a landing point, but I'll take a look at that and see how that can be incorporated, because it is a very key asset to that um, natural resource component, whether it's through rehabilitation or just, you know, the access and availability. Right, and, and I, I notice that unless we have a, uh, unless we state it, I, you know, I'm looking at the, the fencing that is in need of repair in that park. Right. I'm not even sure what the function of that fencing is at this point because it, it's so... Uh, well, it's interesting. When I first saw that park, I didn't know what you guys had in there. <laughs> I thought you were containing a herd of deer or elk or something. Yeah, yeah, well... <laughs> Anyway, so I would, I would recommend that you look and see if there is a, a place that you could... Okay. Uh, sorry, Jeff just pointed out in the strategies uh, 1.3.4, we do talk about uh, considering Bredesen as a focal point, so within so, the okay. tactics. Thank you. So, but um, it may make sense to bring it forward. So just one question I had is there's a lot of activity in this particular topic, the natural resource and sustainable parks. And the resource really doesn't come on until 2017. With the, so do we have enough, do you have staff that can handle kind of all the pre-work up into that point? Or is there still a piece of this that we need to determine how we resource? Because when I looked at the, all the 15 initiatives, all the 16 initiatives, the bulk of them happen in the next two years. It just seemed like a big resource um, need. Yes, Brenda, I, I would agree. I think we still have a little bit of work that we need to do on the years, um, the, the implementation years on the plan, and uh, we'll be working on those. And uh, we'll, Susan and I are scheduling a meeting sometime within the next week to really try to fine-tune, and then we will do the same thing with Terry as well. I think we need, to, we need to stretch a few things out and figure out how we might be able to um, incorporate some of these items into a budget. Okay, that makes sense. And the other thing I was thinking is on the, the priority projects of the strategic plan, which you highlight at the end of the implementation yes. framework. So those are, that's, that's a great list. And it would be nice to somehow match that to the implementation plan. Like this matches our number one priority. And here are all the activities that support that. That would have, I was trying to do that myself, but it was getting, you know, it's kind of hard because they're kind of split up in different areas. But I think that would be helpful to know what each of these things is supported by, and then also then how the board can help support it um, for Anne from her resource plan. I, I agree with that. If that's true priorities, and that's our list, and that's our strategic plan, every document and everything we do going forward should reflect that. So we should try to get that in order. I think that makes sense. I, just to add on that, I was doing the same thing and thought really what you could, what I would recommend we look at doing is that ought to replace the key recommendations from the assessments. So we have this key recommendations from the assessments across the five different areas. But if you took those 12 top priorities, you could map those to those five different areas. And in fact, most of them are also already on here. But we've just added other things, which tends to confuse it. But if those truly are the top 12, I would put those underneath, which is in your page 13, your key recommendations from the assessments and get rid of everything else. And then you have the top 12 things right there across the five areas. That's great. Thank you. Yeah. If, if you don't get rid of everything else, at least have them prioritized according to the priority list, right? So, yes. Yeah. I'd still get rid of everything else, but that's my bias. 
<laughs> let's be sharp. If these are the top 12, let's have the top 12. All right, duly noted. Oh, so um, the next one we talk about is the goals and strategies for parks, open space, and trails. And, um, you know, this deals specifically with the, the, the parks, the open space, and the trails. Um, and we highlight the goals under this as well as the strategies and the tactics forward in the end. So any comments or recommendations here? Okay, so I just had a question. You know, the first one's a big one. It's about adding... 15 miles of trails, right? Mm -hmm. So I think then that needs to somehow match into our funding piece so that we know how does that get funded. Because um, I'm assuming that would be a pretty big... Yeah, um, yeah. And whether it comes from something with the city allocates something to us or we can use some of those other funding ideas that we had in our um, strategy, that would be helpful, I think. Okay, no, that's great, thank you. And I just want to clarify... That that it sounds as if those are not necessary. Those are not in park trails. Those are connecting parks. Right? Yeah, yeah. Those are more of the connection or the well. Then it can be within certain parks. We wanted to try to create that trail network. Um, so part of that overall street trail master plan, um, we want to kind of begin to develop that and enhance that. So I think some of it could be within parks or connections through parks to connect you to other areas within the system. Um, because I, I feel as if this is a wonderful goal for the city, but I'm not sure how um, the Parks Department will be able to manage a goal that really touches on transportation and public works to the extent that it does. It seems as if this is um, uh, something that I would... I'm a little uncomfortable about having it be in the park strategic plan when it sh maybe should be in public works, it should be part of the living streets policy or, or transportation, or we um, create a process where when there is a street development project that, that then gets put to parks to, to make sure that we're in the process but I'm not sure if it's really parks money that should be um, going toward creating this because if it's streets, it doesn't seem like it should be part of our budget. Right, and I, I don't know that necessarily it would mean that it would come out of our budget. Um, we have a great working relationship with both the public works and engineering departments and I know that anytime they're looking at reconstruction projects, whether it's streets or sidewalks, they're now looking at how they can connect and how they can improve park uh, trail systems throughout. So it would be my opinion that just because it's in here doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be paid for out of the parks department budget. I could see priorities being to like places like Braemar, if we create a trail system through there or connecting through the wooded area or Weber Woods, that those could kind of take priorities, uh, priority status in the park strategic master plan. Because mm -hmm. I think some of the city projects may take a little longer <laughs> with just easements and right-of-ways and making that work. Right, so is that goal in here that we would be um, uh, putting in parks within our, uh, paths within our parks? The we can clarify is... that if it's not, yeah. yeah. There's an um, a area on safety in this section. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, there's the first one says complete safety data for each park and facility and evaluate for trends. And it says something about create priority plan based on data and general feedback. So where, where would that data or general feedback um, come from? Well, yeah, I, th I think it's a, more of a, like a polling, getting from the community how, what they feel is unsafe, um, the insecurities that they may have. Some of the national trending that we're seeing generally throughout park systems kind of talks about that increased need for safety um, and people feeling threatened in more public environments than they have before just because of the population growing and changing dynamic of 
society, so to speak. Um, but I think it's, it's kind of going through that next step process to see exactly what people are, how they're interpreting it, whether they need more lighting, whether they need better policing, whether they need more open spaces so it's more visible, that sort of thing. So I think taking that next level, we didn't get that deep into this, so we're just kind of making those broad scale recommendations that would kind of begin to cover some of those things. Um, but yeah, that's... Okay, that's helpful. I wasn't sure if there was something that had come back that had specifically detailed some safety issues, but you're saying the next, there's, it might be a concern the next step would actually be to... Yeah. To do a survey or to get some better to feedback. find out okay. more detail, yeah. Um, because I think one of the things, that, some of the focus groups pointed towards that, general community stuff, and I think our open house, there was some comments towards it as well, and just some of the trending that we've seen um, working on other park systems. Edina is pretty fortunate not to have uh, a, a large uh, number of safety issues, so to speak, that have become public, but a lot of other park systems have. Um, and I would, um, I've looked into the Edina level of service standards, that chart, and um, I do think that there is some room for uh, discussion on that and, and possible revision. Um, so uh, that's an area that I, I would be commenting on in that uh, since we're, this is pulling from that for um, what meets our needs or what doesn't meet our needs. Right, so. and I think that's great, and we, we would welcome that feedback. We could okay. have the discussion now, too, if you'd like, but um, I think it's a really important thing to establish where you want to be um, compared to where you are now and to really tailor what your needs are based on, you know, a lot of this level of service is based on national and regional standards and not EDINA-specific. So if EDINA wants to have you know, five times more of one thing than another community has just because that's what you do well and you do it a lot, then I think that makes sense to make those recommendations in the level of service for sure. Right. And I, I, I do think that that's, I, I like the way that that was presented and I, I agreed with most everything, but there are some that I, I thought that um, I didn't, so. Okay. That's but great. This is going to be a long night if we went through that. But. We always have time for you, Ellen. <laughs> um, Careful. <laughs> we've had many discussions. <laughs> so, um, uh, the goals and uh, purpose goals strategies for recreational facilities, this deals specifically with uh, specific recreational facilities, um, some of the enterprise facilities that you have as well. Comments, recommendations? I guess for that one, I was, it made me think about how we've got these different levels or tiers of parks, and I guess I'm still not clear in my own mind about a, you know, what should we provide in a mini park versus what should we provide for a special use park or a neighborhood park? What should that be? And, and when we kind of lump them all together, it's just hard to say as a whole, they should all be better, but what should they really be for a neighborhood? Okay like a more clear definition of what defines a mini park from an Edina point of view instead of just a national definition of what defines a mini park. Yeah, I get and, that. and looking at where they're distributed across Edina. Sure, okay. So um, I am interested in pursuing the, the fact that the document doesn't address uh, fitness and health and wellness to the extent that Edina is lags other communities, benchmark communities, and nationally. So I would like to see um, some more tactics that that discuss that, um, okay. because it is something that comes up both in all of the surveys um, that we've ever done. It comes up as we compare ourselves to our benchmark communities. It comes across if we looked at. Um, our national uh, median, how many, how many communities have fitness, uh, f offer fitness facilities, and we as a city really don't. And um, so I would like to see something in here for health and wellness, mm -hmm. fitness, um, and also the fact that we lack a true recreation center.
and then recreation programs, purpose, goals, and strategies. Um, comments, recommendations. Alan, part of what you just mentioned is stated in 1.11. Well, that actually, as I'm looking at 1.11 and 1.12, um, we have to be really careful about how we're, we're using the word community center. Um, and I look at this and I think, well, if we just rebrand the senior center as a community center, we still don't have fitness facilities. Right, so we can't have the programs, and then we have the facilities. The They're not, we have the, we, and we also have the, what we know we're missing, and what our residents say we need. <laughs> we have the programs that we want, but we don't have the facilities at all. So. Um, for fitness, I would suggest that that's the one thing that's missing. Um, the other thing that we really haven't talked about is um, uh, uh, pools, indoor pools. And I noticed that that's not in the earlier section on that level of service. And I would like that included. I'd like to see how we compare to other communities. Um, that's one of the items that residents have mentioned that they would like to see. And I'm just curious about that. You know, I know that in Edina Vision that uh, young families talk about recreational pools um, space, and I know that seniors talk about warm pools. So I'm, I'm wondering how that fits in. And okay. I noticed that it's not in the report at all. And I think when you did the analysis, we talked specifically about outdoor pool facilities, right? I don't know. In the benchmark, yeah. But, yeah, we'll take a look at that. I, yeah, look at it. I, yeah. I didn't see one on indoor pools. You're right. Um, and do you have benchmark information on art centers? On art centers? I don't believe it's in the report currently, but we can double-check to see if that is something that agencies benchmark against. And if it is and we have that data that we can include it. Okay, thank you. I guess I'd like to see a little something too on, I'm not sure if the benchmark communities would have an art center as we say it, or it's all encompassing, or if they break it into maybe two different facilities and they have different activities separated. Um, I'd be curious to see if that's something we should be looking at as well. Yeah, and what, what do people break out what a recreational community center is? What, what uses? I don't think it gives a definition. It just defines it as recreational community center. And I think it encompasses a ton of different things. So art could be part of that. But a lot of communities do have specific art and performance centers separate. So I think some of our benchmark communities might actually have that. So yeah, a, a common benchmark question is whether or not you have an indoor recreation or community center. And then common components of a recreation center are sometimes benchmarked, like a gymnasium or multi-purpose rooms or a fitness center, um, but not necessarily every component of a, of a community center. Okay. Thanks. And lastly, uh, finance and management, uh, purpose, goals, and strategies, comments, recommendations. Okay, then I'll move on. So the priority projects is strategic plan. We've heard some feedback on this. It was great feedback with regards to the, uh, the top priorities that we're identifying here. The intent of this was, um, based on recommendations made in previous park board meetings, was to kind of give us a, a top 10 list, so to speak, that we could focus on and actually gain some momentum and gain some ground on this implementation plan with regards to the strategic plan and get some of these uh, top priorities realized within the first few years. I know looking at some of the dates, and that's what Anne's talking about, we're kind of still working through that. Um, but based on the dates, it's basically a five-year strategic plan because <laughs> we kind of have everything identified within that time period, and some of that may stretch out. Um, 
but I think this is kind of the overall list. So uh, create the multi-use trail loop system through the city. Um, that has been identified throughout the community survey, through the focus groups, through the uh, internal discussions that we've had with staff and with the city. Um, I think that's a really key component, and that's why it's number one on our list, um, as well as the multi-generational community center that's all-inclusive. Uh, that was also brought up as well as being a key element through surveys and, and uh, feedback. And then the higher natural resource manager to guide, um, that deals a lot, Brenda, with what you're talking about, a lot of these natural resource initiatives, and how do we have somebody to control and manage that and begin to direct a lot of those initiatives that we're talking about, and that's kind of, we think, where it starts. Uh, the fourth one would be to replace or decommission community park buildings that have outlived their designate designed lifespan and currently insufficient in providing services. This, like you said, and I think it's great to tie back to some of those key things that we're talking about in guiding principles, but um, it's identified in the CIP plan to begin some patchwork on some of these buildings, but then it's also identified to replace some of those, and we think, based on our recommendations, you should just move ahead with replacement and creating more of an equality of space throughout the park system for, for all the neighborhoods, um, as well as uh, providing a space that uh, could be used better by those neighborhoods and those communities than currently is given to them right now. Um, relo relocate or uh, renovate the Donna Art Center to provide a facility that best supports it. Whether it is actually renovating the existing facility, creating better parking, creating better access through ADA and just usability of space, or actually finding them a new home um, within Edina. Um, and, and, and I think as part of this, we're kind of talking about trying to centralize that to balance out some of the enterprise facilities within the city um, to give more opportunities to the central and north half of Edina. Um, replace inadequate and outdated play areas and playgrounds. This is beginning in the CIP plan. Roslyn Park is identified to be replaced and a number of other parks. We have a, a list that identifies their ages and then based on that age, I think you can begin to uh, redevelop those playgrounds to be all-inclusive, uh, ADA accessible, and provide different play opportunities than you had currently had in the past, whether that be through nature play or just other forms of new uh, playground structure design. And then improve marketing and communication delivery. Um, a lot of that comes from the idea of people trying to find out what's available within the park system and the programs within the city. Um, we had uh, some comments saying that I bring out my community park brochure, my community ed brochure, and then I go to the website and I try to cross-pollinate all that information to come out with what I'm going to do for the year uh, with my children. So I think just to make that more accessible and easy, easy to use, easy to find, if someone's starting in a park program, which is your introduction, how do they progress from that into organized sports and, and different types of activities such as that. So making that communication better and then internally doing it as well so that the park board has a direct connection with the marketing and resources within the city to kind of better suit and better deliver uh, their programs and their needs. Uh, strength and financial sustainability, um, that kind of says what it is, to kind of make the parks more viable, um, use better methods of maintenance, better methods of um, uh, park installations that are require less maintenance, whether that be taking out a lot of mowed lawn area, introducing some more native plantings within the park system to help reduce some of that maintenance and also answer our, our question of introducing more natural areas to the park system. Um, and then provide additional community gathering areas. Um, this was that idea of whether you have a park building structure or as the case in Bredesen, if we don't build um, an environmental center that we build maybe a pavilion structure that could be an outdoor classroom for staging areas where people can gather before they go on a walk in the trail system, begin to learn something under a covered roof, and then just provide those different opportunities as an example in Fred Richards, you know, a larger community type park system that could be used for large events. Um, develop community driven master plans for parks uh, throughout the system. This ties back to what was brought up earlier in the golf course discussion to develop a park for Braemar. And then in our city council review that we had last week, we kind of talked about what triggers this. And we're going to try to develop something that'll identify what triggers a master plan within the park system, whether it's a cash value or just the number of projects that have to occur within that to begin to say that, okay, now we need a park master plan for that area or whether it's even a time issue or condition, like after 10 years, we have to redo a master plan for this park. And that way, that helps you to guide the directions and the decisions made in those parks. Like, do we need a playground in this location, or do we need a building in this location? And it kind of helps you make those informed decisions instead of doing ad hoc implementation over time. 
And then finally, develop business plans for all enterprise facilities throughout the park system. And this kind of ties into your mandate of making the enterprise facilities at least break even, if not profitable, throughout the park system. Terry, are these in a specific order? Like, do you feel like if you looked at the top five, those are the most important, or are they all important, or how do you how do you view them? If you look at the number we had, they're all important. Because <laughs> we tried to weed it down to the ones that... Uh, we thought were the most important, but also the ones that are easily achievable as well. Um, they're piggybacking on existing con existing um, strategies that you have or part of your CIP and what you have to get done and what would help improve the park system immediately as well. So there's a little bit of ranking in there. Um, the trails is at the top, and some of the key things are at the top that were brought forward in the needs assessment and the focus groups and some of the workshop process and the community survey. So there's, there is a bit of a priority, but there's not really a priority. We kind of see all 12 as being critical and moving forward. And it's not to say this couldn't be expanded if you feel there are other ones that we might need to add to this before we finalize the document. For example, I'm concerned with if we list hire a natural resource manager, which would be a, a lot of money. Um, and I know that that would then need to be funded. The work that they would do would need to be funded. And I just want to make sure that as we talk about the key, re getting rid of all the other key recommendations, um, if we just leave, if we leave just this, whether or not our, we are going to be in the next 10 years doing what we really want to do environmentally, or if there might be a, a different um, strategic message about the environment. We, we talked about that a little bit, and in, in can you bring some of these initiatives forward, like do a resource system plan? Um, can you do that in-house without having a, a manager? Um, can you begin some of the Buckthorn initiatives that have been done and continue them without a manager? Um, can you begin to kind of get a handle on everything you have within the system without a manager and guiding that? I think it could happen. I think what came forward through our discussions was it would probably be easier to do and easier to fulfill if you had somebody actually managing that within the, the, the staffing. Um, but it's open to interpretation. That's why we're here. So, Can we afford not to have a resource manager? When we look at the adjacent communities, many of our communities surrounding have full-time natural resource managers. Yeah, and I think it's a great way to frame the question because if you look at that of the top 12 projects we had, that's the only one that falls under natural resources and sustainable parks. But the, the ask you have to have is, does that drive the rest of the things on there? Mm -hmm. And if it does, then it's worth having and it's worth spending the money on. If it doesn't, if we could remove that and still think we can accomplish some of these other things, then it's a fair question to raise. I don't think the natural resource agenda will be driven without the position. Okay, I, I, it's not that I'm not for this. I'm just stating that I am concerned about our only mention of environment is this one, and uh, and I'm hoping that it will get funded. But if not, then there's that's it. That's mm -hmm. there's nothing for the environment. Well, well, I don't I don't want you to think as these twelve priorities as being the end all to this. I think everything that's listed within our implementation plan and the appendices of the tactics and strategies, I think they're all important. We just wanted to identify a lot of the key things that would bring it forward and we feel, talking with Anne and staff, that this is a real critical step to getting that whole environmental initiative moving forward. And that's why we brought it up as the top 12. Okay. You know? Um, and then I, I guess I would, I'd like to comment on the first one, this loop trail. I, I'd like to in, increase the trails in the city. I'd also like to make sure that we have a sustainable way um, for maintaining the trails that we have and, um, and have a plan for that and, in, and also a plan for increasing the trails within our parks. So I don't know if that's 
part of this one thing, but that's clearly what the residents have been talking about. When they talk about trails, I don't think that they're talking about on-street trails. Yeah. So, yeah, no, and I think you're, you're totally right on that, and I think this, the plan that we took a stab at in there was to try to connect the system. It was kind of a, a drive we had or initiative we had talking with Ann and staff was how do we connect everything together to make it more accessible, creating that grand rounds kind of idea within the city of Edina to tie it, all the park system together. Now, based on the fact that a lot of the land is developed and a lot of land's not available to be able to just put trail systems in, we kind of have to work throughout what we have for a streetwide system as well. But how do we begin to identify and develop those so they seem more um, trail friendly instead of just being a sidewalk or a painted green line on the side of the road? Um, and I think that's part of the initiative to create a trail master plan to begin to really identify that. You know, we've, we've done that kind of broad brush stroke on top saying, this is a potential that's there based on what's been identified by transportation and public works and what we've identified with the park staff to say that this is how we could possibly connect it. Now let's figure out how to do that and do it the best way. Um, and I think that would be the next step. Okay. So if I could build off of Ellen's questions and just think about strategy in general again. Right. For, for me, the purpose of a strategy is to allow an organization to make choices. And a good test of that is, how does it allow us to say no to something and yes to something else? And if, even if you thought as a community board we shouldn't necessarily be saying no to things that the community wants, how does it allow us to prioritize? And, and so that's what I'm still challenging us to look at, to say, is this giving us enough meat on that to allow us as a board, and more so Anne and her team as... You know, as a department to do that. If I look at the macro view, what we have in this document is five areas of development embedded in that 13 broad goals, 36 specific strategies, and 125 tactics for action. How are they to decide what they do and what they don't do? Or do they just start checking off all 125, right? And when we get to the end of it, we say, all right, time for a new strategy. And that's what I'm still struggling with. You know, if I kind of go back to some of my strategic work and we pull out things we like to use as a reference. There's a Japanese proverb that says, vision without action is a daydream. Action without vision is a nightmare. And I don't want to create something that becomes a nightmare for our department to try to, you know, go ahead and execute. Or, or another one, tactics without strategy is the noise before defeat. And I look at this 125 tactics for action and challenge myself to say, have we given them the direction to say yes to some, no to others, or start to prioritize. And I'm still kind of sensing that, at least for me, it's not quite there yet. And Anne, I'd be interested in your input from having to lead this going forward. Do you think there's enough direction there for you to, to say no to something and yes to something else and be able to defend it? I feel like there is a significant amount of direction in this document. Um, certainly there are going to be um, a lot of areas that are going to be open for conversation. There's going to be a lot of it that is going to need long-term planning um, support from the park board and support from the city council for funding. Um, but in terms of actually going through the document and prioritizing what we're going to do first, second, and third. To be perfectly honest, I haven't gotten to that point yet. Mm -hmm. um, that's where I look at how we're going to prioritize the implementation plan and, and look at some of those years. Um, I'll certainly look at that in the next two weeks prior to. Um, are there too many? Possibly there might be too many. It's a lot of tactics. I, I would agree. It's a lot of tactics for us to look at in the next several years. And so as you look through it the next couple of weeks, what I'd ask you to test is, does the rest of the document give you enough of a framework to say, I can use this to, to, to defend why this is a priority and this isn't? Sure. Otherwise, you're going to get people saying, well, Ann, you shouldn't have taken that one. You should have taken this one. All right. Sure. Because the community wants it. Well, the community wants a lot. Mm -hmm. And we don't just want, you know, this to be a wish list. We want it to be a strategic direction for you. All right. Thank you. Yeah, I think there, there are different um, opportunities. You know, obviously when opportunities become available through funding or through donation or through initiatives that might pull something in a priority higher than the others, 
I think that could dictate what might happen before something else happens, but that's an unknown variable that you can't really rely on. So I think a lot of the things that we have identified in our, our purpose and our goals and our strategies, specifically in the purpose of the guiding principles, um, when we look at those things, how do those guiding principles apply to each one of those specific goals that we have? And maybe the one that has the most uh, uh, guiding principles applying to that, uh, that goal and that strategy kind of takes the forefront because it's answering a lot of your questions under one implementation strategy. So that could begin to uh, dictate the order of the priority of projects that are beginning to happen. That could be just one technique. But we'll take a look at that definitely. Thank you, Greg. And I think one other thing that I might add, too, is that as I look at this document, there is a lot of work that is going to need to be accomplished with other departments. Um, not just in our enterprise facilities, but in the communications department, the engineering department, the public works department, park maintenance. It's going to take a lot of coordination, and it's going to take a lot of work on, uh, on our part to make sure that we're coordinating tasks, work plans, budgets, um, you know, all those types of things. So it's, it's definitely going to be a very significant project for us moving forward. Um, can I... I, I want to just ask something about the financial and management portion of this implementation. This, I understand that this is all a part of it, but one of the uh, things that I was uh, hoping to achieve with the strategic plan was that we would get uh, a, more of a, a schedule or a sustainable refunding of our parks programs. Um, for example, we know, we just saw that slide on the golf course where we should have been reinvesting in the golf course and every 15 years we need to do the tees and so that we don't have to spend $7 million at, you know, at, at the end of 20 years. Um, I was hoping to see something similar to that for um, playgrounds and other structures. And I, I don't see that in here. I'm concerned about um, the sustain, when you talk about f financial sustainability, I want to make sure that we have this built into the system, that we're working within our budget. And I don't see those kind of goals expressed here in the way that I was hoping. The, more of the, the financial prudence you know, we talked about the enterprises being self-sustaining, but um, that's not in our financial management goal. It may be in here somewhere. I have to admit that 200 pages I haven't gotten through. Yeah, we actually business recommend plan. business plans for the ones that haven't had business plans being done um, so that that can begin to start that for the, for, for the enterprise facilities specifically. Obviously, we didn't get into the, we Actually, the enterprise facilities weren't part of our charge on the strategic plan, but we've incorporated a lot of that into it. Uh, but I know what you're talking about from playgrounds, and we do have the list. Uh, maybe it's just how do we tie that back to what you're seeing here so that you can see the clear order and what we're trying to define, similar to the buildings we're talking about you know, with regards to Strakauer and some of the other parks that to have out-of-date building facilities. And, and I think we've made comment to them with regards to don't try and do, you know, quick repair with siding and roofing just to maintain it for a couple of years in order to tear it down later to rebuild something more adequate. Um, so I, we, we could probably... Yeah, well, we, I, and yeah. I know that, and that's exactly where I'm going, coming from, is that there are parks in there that have still have 60-year-old park shelters that we are not recommending replacing. And that, you know, I'm a little surprised that that's not, that in the next 10 years, we don't say that that's. Are you specifically the, the buildings? Yes. The warming houses? Yes. I think we've made recommendation to replace every one of them. <laughs> no. I think there's like six that are the bomb shelter style. I think, I think we made recommendations to replace all of them. And that's based on the CIP too. So. Uh, I know that I just read that Highlands is not set for replacement. So I haven't looked at all of them, but I, I looked at my own park. Okay, we'll take a look at that though. 
take a look at yeah. that. Because Make sure I mean, it's in that's there for an, sure. It's an old building. It's not functional. I mean, yeah, no. it's, a, it's an eyesore. And, um, and yet I, I recognize that what I'm saying is I just want it to be feasible. That we're, if, I'm not saying um, build, build, build. I'm saying let's get a, a program for replacement that is financially feasible for that and for the trails. Because I guess our, our two goals are we're trying to make things more equitable across all the parks and yet prioritize at the same time for what's the most broken. Because in the past, we've had projects pop up kind of from nowhere that we're not able to look to any priority Retire, list to I say, well, that should be way at, lower than this one. Here. So that's really what we need at the end of the okay. day. I'll show Thank you. you. I just read it. It's like keep the building. I think that's what Greg's getting at as well, right? The, yes. the document needs to help and the city staff day to day, but it needs to help us to prioritize and, and the whole system to work yep. efficiently with, with priority. And it's... It's similar to a, a corporate strategy, but it's not quite the same. But I, I appreciate your comments. They're really, um, we, can, we can do some more yeah. thinking on it to see if there's something else we can add or detract from this to really help us um, do what we need to do and the, the folks that replace us in the next 10 years. And I think, you know, Ellen and I found on page A14 a place where it had highlands. So I think we just have to make sure in the document. Yeah. That's that very, con so. it's um, consistent. Consistent, because there might be another place that it, it didn't mm -hmm. have that as a replacement. So um, just as you added it, just to, because there's so many pages, right? It's a lot of information. And I, I know everything you've said, I, I've seen it somewhere, but it's hard to find exactly where it is. So Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'd have offer one other comment up in the front of the document, page 15. Mm -hmm. uh, I like the fact that you now have embedded a vision. I, I would offer that rather than being the vision of the strategic plan, that it's the vision of the Dyna Park and Rec Department. The, the, the strategic plan itself doesn't really need to have a vision, but the department should have a vision and a mission, right? And then the, the plan is helping to engage and enable that. And, and then the only other thing I'd offer on that is consider striking the words one of and be bold enough to say our, our vision is to be recognized as Minnesota's premier parks and recreation and trail system. What's one of? Top five? Top ten? Top fifteen? Just behind Egan? I, I don't know what that means, so why not? Go for the top if it's a vision. I'd also like to add, because Greg neglected to, a lot of humility, I'm, I'm sure, but on page two, when it lists the uh, folks involved, Greg is the only member that's not listed. So, Yeah, we'll clarify those names with Ann, for sure. I'm sorry, what's, what's that? He hasn't paid us for that yet. Okay. <laughs> I said we'll clarify that with Ann, definitely. All right. What, what do you have left, Terry? I think that's it. We're just any other questions. So our next okay. steps will be to revise, uh, make these revisions, um, uh, take in any other considerations that come forward from Ann and her staff, um, and then we'll bring that forward to you on the 9th of June and make that presentation for final approval and recommendation to move forward to City Council. Hey, one last thing, is, and maybe it's embedded in, in all of the different tactics, but when we come out of this, will we also have a set of metrics by which we'll measure the progress we're making? And will those metrics be tied to the five different development areas? We could definitely take a look at that. Okay. Yeah, I like that. I don't know that 130 whatever tactics is too many if it's a long-term situation here. We, we tackle the 12 most important ones every year. Um, but the metrics, right? I, I mean, that's going to allow us to continue down the right path year after year after year. So I agree with that. All right, any other comments? No? All right. Well, thank you, Terry. Appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Um, I think we're uh, ready to move on. There's not a whole lot to say on uh, the council updates. We have information in our packets. Uh, next is chair and board member comments. 
And I guess I'd like to say something, but maybe Brenda wants to say something as well. I think we have determined as a leadership group here that the August meeting might be uh, the best for our retreat that we have planned. And I think and uh, reserve some space at Centennial Lakes. So make sure I believe it's August 11th. Correct me if I'm wrong with that, with the date. But uh, if anyone's putting together travel plans and whatnot, it'd be nice to have as many people here as possible for that. Brenda, do you want to say anything on that or, or not? So Dan and I are working on the agenda, but if you have any ideas for it, please send those to me, or you can send them to Ann. She'll forward them to me, because we'll, be, uh, we'll be soliciting your ideas. We'll put out a draft and see if there's any um, additional items, probably in the next couple of weeks, don't you think, Dan? Sure. sure. Yeah. Okay, thank you. That's all I have. Is there any other board members that have uh, anything they'd wish to vocalize at this point? No? All right, it's okay. Then, oh, Actually, I do. Sorry. <laughs> um, uh, I understand that we are working in, with a parallel process with Grandview, and we were just at a meeting discussing the potential uses of Grandview, um, uh, the, the former public works site. And so many of the potential uses, the, so many of our strategic initiatives could be met in that site or should be discussed in that site uh, with respect to that. Um, and what I'm hearing is that there are uh, uh, proposals out there, for example, to move different facilities and um, and we are still as a board not talking about that and yet it looks as if City Council is going to be deciding this in a month or so so I'm just wondering if it is possible um, that we as a group uh, ask City Council to include uh, Parks Director Catry um, in the process of designing the community features, the public use of that public space. Um, we talk about wanting to make it financially sustainable and, and feasible, and uh, and if our depart if, if this council is going to have to somehow run that um, or oversee the policy on that, I think we should be involved. And I think she should be involved in saying uh, this is how we could use it and, um, and these are the activities that could make it sustainable and these are the activities that would be part of our strategic plan that would fulfill some of the strategic initiatives. You want to come? Sure. I'd like to. I'd like you to. I think that um, I think that the park board is going to be included in this process very soon. Um, I know that in uh, in another week the city council is uh, is going to be talking about uh, Grandview even further. We have started to talk more specifics about um, what could be contained in a facility at Grandview. I have been part of those conversations, and my understanding is that uh, very soon um, the project will be turned over more to me, our department, and the park board to help with that process. Excellent. All right. Any others? No? All right. Then we're down to staff comments. And if you would. Thank you. I, um, it's a very busy time in our department. I'd like to let you know of a few things that we have going on, and I'll try to make it as quick as I can and as short as I can. Um, the Braemar Field Dome is down for the season. Uh, it went down on the, on the 4th, and it'll go back on November 1st. And our first outdoor turf uh, use of the field was last night. So uh, everything went well. 
Uh, at the, uh, the Braemar Field and Sports Dome site, the site work is being completed. The concrete, asphalt, parking lots, landscaping, um, all that type of work will be completed by the end of June. Uh, construction at Pamela Park has been going very well. In fact, uh, we're very much ahead of schedule uh, because of the good weather that we've had this spring. If you haven't met out there, the old shelter building is gone. Uh, in the uh, sand peat field, the sand, the peat, and the irrigation is done. We're going to be doing seeding of that field this week. Uh, the retaining walls in the west parking lot are going to be done by the end of the week. The paths have been graded, and they'll be getting asphalt within the next two weeks. Sod has been added to two new infiltration ponds, one on the east side of the park and one on the west side of the park. And the parking lot expansion on the south side should be finished within the next two weeks. And uh, we hope to have the whole project wrapped up by the end of August, including the new shelter building. So it's, uh, it's coming along really well at Pamela. So if you have a chance to, uh, to check it out, we've been using the artificial turf field now for, uh, for several weeks, and uh, it's, been, uh, it's been very popular. Edinburgh Park got a new slide last week to, re to replace an original wave slide, so that's a fun amenity. We have a, a slide naming contest going on right now. The Aquatic Center pool is being painted right now. The Flow Rider pump was installed yesterday, and pool filling will take place on uh, May 19th. So uh, certainly a sign of spring and summer to come. We've hired 35 guest services staff and 53 lifeguards. So we're a big employer at the Aquatic Center during the summer months. The Centennial Lakes putting course opened on May 1st and uh, will be open daily until September 27th. Um, and a couple of ribbon cutting ceremonies that I want to make sure that you're aware of. Uh, we have a ribbon cutting ceremony for the Tin Fish and Clubhouse renovations that will take place on Monday the 18th at 4 p.m. And I'd love for all of you to attend if you're available. And the Veterans Memorial dedication will be on Memorial Day on Monday, May 25th at 10 a.m. And uh, that project is coming along really well, and the granite is scheduled to be installed this week. So that's all I have. Thank you. All right. Good stuff. Thank you, Anne. And seeing no further items on the agenda, I make a motion to adjourn the meeting. Is there a second? Second. All right. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed? More than aye. All right. Meeting adjourned.